13. This is driving me mad, you know, Ari said in a completely conversational tone, as he and Karun stared down into Corson's ravine. Corson was dozing on one side of the nest, Nofret was sitting on the other side, and the dragonettes were tumbling all over each other in between them, in a clumsy, awkward tangle of wings and limbs. They looked like a moving pile of jewelry. Karun was getting very, very tired of hearing Ari fret over Nofret's safety. Nofret herself wasn't putting up with it, which was probably why Ari was fretting at Karun instead of his royal wife. After a fortnight of this, Karun was at the end of his patience too. And truth to tell, Karun was rather jealous. There had been so much public pressure for the two of them to become an official couple that even if they had been indifferent to each other, they'd have probably been officially married by now. As opposed to his own situation, he and Akat Ten were both considered too young for any serious commitments, and even if they had been older, well, they still had duties and responsibilities that didn't leave a lot of room for anything but those duties and responsibilities. There wasn't any special public ceremony to make a couple man and wife, not even for two people who were functioning as rulers, even if they didn't have thrones or crowns. But there was no doubt that Ari's courtship of Nofret had succeeded, seeing as they were sharing a sleeping chamber, even if Karun hadn't already known they had privately gone before both Caleth and the high priest of Thet to make their union official. And Karun was jealous, but also apprehensive. It was one thing to want Akat Ten so badly his loins ached, but it was quite another to pair off like Ari and Nofret had. There were consequences to that, above and beyond the obvious, consequences he wasn't at all sure he was ready to deal with. For instance, Lord Yatirin might decide that her husband ought to be trying to curb some of Akat Ten's more outrageous escapades, and not her father. In fact, Lord Yatirin might even insist on some similar condition before he would bestow his approval on the match. Karun was quite certain such a thing was entirely beyond his abilities. Akat Ten was going to do exactly as she always had, and no one was going to be able to stop her once she made up her mind about it. He was also not so secure in his position as wing leader that he thought he dared to tip the balance among them by turning an unofficial and private relationship into a public one. Akat Ten was part of the wing after all, and if they were husband and wife, the others might reasonably expect there was favoritism going on. And there were other consequences too, and lots of them. Those were nothing more than the tip of what might be a very, very large rock under the sand dune. Consequences like, as Akat Ten had said herself, babies. Whatever mysterious means there were that women in Alta and Tia used to regulate such a thing, they evidently weren't available here in Sanctuary yet. If the rash of big bellies among Lord Yatirin's household and the Tian priestesses was anything to go by. Still, on the other hand, there was a wing full of handsome young men that Akat Ten flew with every day. True, Lord Yatirin had given his consent, but all of them were better matches for her than a former serf who had never been anything more than a simple farmer's son. Granted, the nobles weren't lords of anything right now, but they had the blood and, and he could make himself crazy with thoughts like that in a very short time. So between one thing and another, he was coming to the end of his patience with Ari's fretting. Nelfret says she's fine. Akaten says Corson has accepted her as another dragon. He snapped. There is never a time when someone with a dragon isn't in the air around here to make sure nothing can get at her or Corson. Not that I think anything could show up here that Corson couldn't or wouldn't handle on her own. Enough, Ari. She knows what she's doing. We know what we're doing. So give us all a little credit for caution and good sense, will you? Ari looked taken aback by Karan's tone. I just... worry, he said. Well, it's stupid to worry for no reason, Karun set his chin. If you have to worry, worry about something we've got reasons to worry about. There's plenty of those. Ari said nothing, but he had the grace to look chastised, and he did stop fretting, at least for the rest of that afternoon, which proceeded as it always did. They hunted, going out in turn, while Akat Ten went back to sanctuary and brought back sacrificed animals, Sheep today? It was Hammond's turn to be sacrificed too, and in the interest of encouraging harmony, 
The priests of both Alta and Tia presided over and attended the sacrifices for both sets of gods. In the interest of harmony. Caleth had some ideas on that score. If both sets of priests preside now, well, it won't be long before they're agreeing on a fixed set of rites, and the two sets of gods merge into one. It certainly seemed to be working, if only other problems could be solved so easily. As the sun disk neared the horizon, Ari collected no fret. Cachette was still the biggest, strongest dragon in the wing, and it was much easier for him to carry double. Maybe snapping at Ari had done some good. At least outwardly he didn't act as anxious when he got no fret, and she seemed more relaxed as they all headed back home, flying high to get the advantage of the cooler air. Odd, though, how quickly he, at least, had gotten used to the desert. The heat just didn't seem to bother him as much anymore. He had no idea how prophetic those words about worrying over things we have reason to worry about would be. Because as they arrived back at Sanctuary and started dropping down toward the buildings, they could see that the place was like an overturned beehive, with people milling about and forming little knots of tense conversation. One of Lord Kaman's men was waiting for them as they approached their pens, standing on top of the dividing wall, waving frantically at them. That's not good. Council Chamber! was all he shouted up at them, eyes shielded against the wind of the dragon's wing beats as it kicked up sand. It's an emergency! You go! Akaten called over to him and Ari and Nofret. Land there and send the dragons back! I'll take care of them and rejoin you when I'm done. Kiran did not have to be told twice. He signaled to Avatra to abort her landing. With a grunt of effort, she rode for height. And after a moment of confusion and hesitation, as he resolved the conflict between Habit and Ari's new direction, Cachette followed her. They landed in the street outside the council chamber, the building now serving only the dual purpose of being the place for meetings and Caleth and Merritt's home rather than as a full temple as well. Ari and Nofret were out of the saddle and on the ground as soon as the dragons furled their wings, and running through the doorway before Karun had even thrown his leg over Avatra's back. He slid down her shoulder, then turned and slapped Avatra on the foreleg, and called, Home! And she shoved off from the ground without hesitation. He felt a momentary burst of pride at that. It had taken a long time to train her to follow an order without him on her back but it was more than worth the effort at times like this one. Pichette, however, looked momentarily confused. Karan whistled and got the big male's attention. Pichette, he said firmly, and making the up gesture with both hands. Fly! Pen! Pichette didn't know the word home, which to Avatra meant two things, both sanctuary itself and any pen in which she had spent more than a couple of nights but he did know pen and fly as separate concepts. He just didn't know what fly meant if Ari wasn't on his back. Karan had done a lot more training to make Avatra autonomous from the beginning than Ari had ever done with Cachette. He'd had to. On their trek to Alta, he'd needed to be able to direct Avatra in hunting from some other place than in her saddle, because sometimes he needed to drive the game into Avatra's waiting talons. Cachette, on the other hand, had never had to meet that challenge. The dragon looked at him with his head to one side, as if he was hearing some strange sound he didn't recognize at all. Pen! Karan repeated, putting as much emphasis as he could on the simple word. Cachette knew what it meant, and he'd just seen Avatra fly off in that direction. Surely he could reason out that he was meant to go there too. Cachette blew out his breath in a puff, then turned away. But instead of flying as Avatra had, he stalked off through the streets afoot. People scrambled to get out of his way, not with any sign of fear, but only because the streets of Sanctuary were very narrow, and there really wasn't room for a dragon and even a small person to pass side by side in them. He was going in the right direction. Maybe he remembers walking all those corridors in the Justice compound, Karun thought. He was used to walking in the compound rather than flying. Well, as long as it gets him there on his own, he can walk or fly as he chooses. He turned to enter the chamber himself, reasonably sure that Cachette would get himself to where he belonged, because even if he got confused, 
By now one of the other jousters would have heard he was stalking through the streets and come to guide him back. Or else Akat Ten would send someone to get him. Or both, Karan thought, as he slipped in through the doorway and started to edge around the walls to get to his spot among the other counselors. He saw that there was a woman in the gown of a priestess, a compromise between the tightly pleated mist linen of the Tian priestesses and the loosely draped heavier linen of the Altans. This was mist linen for coolness and comfort, but without pleating, and held in place by twin shoulder pins and a belt. Most other women of sanctuary wore purely Altan gowns, since most women were Altans. And every one of them has confirmed it! The speaker was Tyr Amaten, the priestess of Bichette of the far-seeing eye. She looked very unhappy. I do not know how it is that those whose gift is to see forward did not warn us about this. Because, great lady, their gaze was confused and befogged, Caleth said soothingly. As my gaze has been increasingly confused and befogged, we have known this was happening, as the Magi make the future more uncertain. There is no responsibility to be laid on you or on them. Rather, allow me to thank you for always having the eyes of one of your far-seeing priestesses keep watch over the winged ones of Alta. Your duty is to the people of Tia, not of Alta, and yet you have been bending your eyes to my folk. If you had not, we would never have known they were besieged until it was too late. Besieged? Karan said though it was not really a question. The Magi, of course. And every armed man of their private guard they can put around the Temple of the Twins, Caliph confirmed. I think they would have used the army to break down the doors, except that they knew the army would not obey them in such a task. I wonder how they even get their private guard to attack priests, Lord Kaman said, looking grim. To raise hands against the servants of the gods! They grow bold, these magi, said Patah Hatap, the Tian Thet priest. First they move to take our acolytes, and now your priests. I wonder that they do not use your army. I do not think they could gain obedience from the army to move against the servants of the gods, Heriket said. Oh yes, it has happened in the past, the far past, of our land, but only when the priests themselves were corrupt so corrupt that the people wept beneath their heels. I think you are right, Caliph nodded. We had two warnings it was happening today, one from the acolytes of Bichette, the other a cry for help that I heard from those trapped within the temple. According to my acolytes, the siege began this morning. Somehow enough of the winged ones mustered strength and will to bar the temple doors against the magi, said Tyr Amaten her face a study in anger, though the gods being so insulted were not technically her own. When the Magi could not get at the winged ones, they immediately mounted an armed siege. But it is a curious sort of siege. They mount guard around the temple and let no man in or out, but otherwise do nothing. I think they do not dare yet, Aklatis said, with a nod of his grizzled head. The winged ones are much beloved by the people. The Magi may be saying that the Winged Ones are in danger, and that they are being guarded for their own protection. It may be so. Fortunately, the temple might have been designed to withstand such a siege, Caleth replied, making a soothing motion with his hand. And before my contact with him was blocked, the Winged One who called to me told me that the temple itself was well provisioned and has its own well of pure water. The great danger is that the Magi will decide to use the eye on them. Karun shuddered, and Nofret made a little strangled sound in the back of her throat. Karun was just as glad Akaten wasn't here to have heard that. She had a great many friends in that temple. He remembered only too well seeing the eye lash down out of the Magi's tower. It had been a fearsome sight that had left nothing but earth turned to glass beneath it. I don't think they will yet, Ari said thoughtfully. If they do, they'll lose the very thing they are anxious to have back, and they will earn themselves the hatred of the people. Fear is one thing, it is useful to them, but hatred? Hatred is dangerous, 
Hatred turns fear into anger, and anger turns inaction into action. No, I think they'll wait for a few days at least to see if they can force the winged ones out with hunger or thirst. And when that doesn't work, they'll try some sort of magic first, I think. Maybe try to inspell them from outside and make them walk out, or at least open the doors. Then, perhaps, they will try to get a traitor inside, to open the doors from within. Mind you, I don't think they would hesitate for a moment to kill your winged ones if they can't use them any more. But I believe they will hope to find some other way, not the eye, and that will take time. I hope you're right, Karan thought apprehensively. That is my judgment, too, Caliph agreed. So we have a window of time during which we can get the winged ones out of their trap. He looked straight at Karun. Karun felt his eyes widening as he realized that Caliph intended him and his jousters to rescue the winged ones. There are only ten of us, he objected. We can't carry more than a single passenger, perhaps two if they are children. That would take... Days, Ari interrupted with a nod to Caliph. Or rather, nights because I am in no mood to have that fire sword you call an eye burning me out of the sky. Karan says he thinks it can't work without sunlight, so there's another reason besides stealth to fly in darkness. We couldn't be better set up for this. We're in the sickle moon, and it's waning toward the three nights of dark. We'll have full moon in a fortnight, and I'm willing to try flying in full moon. We'll just have to be careful. Even more careful. Karun countered. But flying by night under a full moon? It's never been done. The dragons are asleep as soon as the sun goes down. He tried and failed to imagine flying in the darkness. It would be worse than flying in a storm, because no matter how high you went, you wouldn't be able to see anything. How could you know where you were? Even at the full of the moon, how could you tell what was below you, or even how near it was? So there's no reason not to try, because the mage I won't be expecting it, Caliph countered serenely. We don't need to get them far, just out of the city proper, and then our human smugglers can take it from there. We can take them to my sister Rikaron's estate, Lord Yatirin said instantly. She has been one of our agents from the first. I can have word to her by the time the moon begins to wax. She can hide some and scatter the rest so that they will come by ones and twos. No one will trouble her. She is known to take dangerously ill patients, and if she brutes it about that she has those with a pox. But we need more than that, Karun said, throttling down his emotions as best he could. Not that he didn't want to help the winged ones escape, but he wanted to have a reasonable chance of getting everyone out alive. We need something to distract the Magi and their men from the temple or we will never get more than a few winged ones away. His stomach clenched as he thought of trying to maneuver Avatra down to a landing when he couldn't even guess where the ground was. The only way we can get them is off the roof, and the only way we can do that is if we have light up there to see where to land. We need something so distracting no one will notice lights on the roof. He shook his head. I never thought I would ever say this, but we need something like an earth shake. Caliph went white, and Merritt put her hand on his arm. He straightened, eyes wide, pupils dilated, and Karan felt a touch of chill on the back of his neck. What do you see? Merritt asked urgently. He stared straight ahead. Fire, he whispered. Fire and smoke in the city, and fire from the sky, and then, then the earth crying out. He went rigid, sitting bolt upright, with his arms stretched rigidly along his thighs, and the chamber fell silent. The hair stood up on Karun's arms, his entire body went cold, and he had seen this before. Caliph was in the grip of a vision, but not the ordinary sort granted by the powers of a priest or a winged one. This was a vision sent straight from the hands of the gods, and their presence hung heavily in this room. Now he was no longer Caliph once prince of Alta. Now he was Caliph who spoke for the gods themselves. Train your dragons, wing leader.
Caleth said, his voice echoing hollowly, as though he spoke in a room much larger than this one. Train them to trust you to be their eyes in the darkness, and make your ways of escape, Alton Lord, and ready your refuge. Watch well, Tian priests, for only you will know when the time has come to act. This one will speak with the winged ones this night, and no one shall prevent his voice nor theirs from being heard. Unhallowed fire will come from the sky, and the earth shall cry out after, and that will be your moment. So prepare to use it, and use it well, for there will not be another chance. Caleth's face had a kind of inner light to it, as if it was a lamp made of alabaster, and his eyes looked into places no human was meant to see. Karun stole a glance at the Tians, who had never seen Caleth speak as the mouth of the gods before. From their widened eyes and startled expressions, they knew very well what they were seeing and hearing, and they were also astonished beyond measure. Has it been that long since one of theirs had had that power? he wondered. Well, it didn't matter, for a moment later, that inward light faded, and Caleth somehow diminished and became himself again. And with it, that paralysis compounded of awe and touch of terror eased, and it was possible to move. Move the Tian priests certainly did. Pataha Top threw himself on his face, and the rest of the Tian priests followed suit before he was halfway to the floor. Oh, do get up, Caleth said mildly, rubbing his eyes and looking down at them. Worship the gods, not their instrument. Do you honor the scalpel or the surgeon? The hammer or the jewelsmith? The pen or the scribe? It is no great virtue of mine that makes me the tool of something greater than I. Your humility is, Patahatop began. Justified, Caleth said firmly. I am a man. I have a gift, but it belongs to the gods, and they may take it from me if they choose just as they gave it to me. Now get up, so that I can tell you what they showed me. I hate speaking to the backs of heads. Slowly, and with some reluctance, the priests rose and resumed their places, although they still regarded Caleth with trepidation and awe. Well, Karan couldn't blame them. He'd seen Caleth serve as the mouth several times now, and it never failed to make him want to fall on his face. At some point before the winged ones run too short of supplies, the people of Alta are going to take note of the fact that literally nothing is going into or out of the Temple of the Twins, Caleth said, as Merritt held his hand. He was looking rather white about the lips, which was normal after he'd been granted a vision or used as the mouth, and in this case, he'd been served with both. I think it will be on or about the time of the full moon but my vision didn't give me too many details of that sort. They're going to mob the temple to demand that the winged ones be let out. Finally, the magi are going to loose the eye on them. No! That cry of anguish and protest was wrung from several throats, Karun's among them, when Caleth held up his hand. Don't worry. They haven't yet completely gone mad. They'll be creeping the fire along at less than a walking pace. They'll mean to frighten the mob away, not to really kill anyone. Caleth frowned. I don't think it's out of kindness, though. I think it's for some other reason. Maybe they're afraid if they use the eye openly on people who only want to protect their winged ones, the people will turn on them. Or maybe they think if they indiscriminately or openly kill too many with the eye. People will flee the city in such numbers that there will be no one left to serve them. I don't think even the army would remain if they overstepped this time. They'll use the eye, Aclatus repeated and snapped his fingers. By the gods, I just put things together. Using the eye will trigger an earthshake, won't it? And that's our distraction. Caleth nodded, looking sick but resolute. Yes. It will, as it has from the beginning. 
Most of us never noticed it because they used the eye so seldom. I don't know why it invokes an earthshake, but it disturbs something beneath the surface of the earth, and the more they use it, the worse the shake. By moving the beam of the eye slowly, they will be using it for quite a long time, and the earthshake that follows, which will come right after sunset, will be very bad indeed. Very bad? Aklatus sucked on his lower lip. Length of shake proportionate to time of use, chasing a mob. It's going to be worse than anything we've seen in our lifetimes. Yes, Caleth replied, and shook his head. Terrifying. And even the Magi will be afraid. There will be fires all over the city, a great deal of chaos, and the guards watching the temple will, for the most part, flee. And that will be the distraction you need, Karun. For that night, and the next three, there will be no one watching the temple. Instead, the Magi will order the doors blocked or sealed shut, certain that the people will have too many problems of their own to think about releasing the winged ones, and equally certain that the temple will also have its share of deaths and injury. They will trust to the eye and the earthshake to drive the winged ones out and into their hands. The run felt nausea in the back of his throat. He had endured the aftermath of one of the earthshakes that had wrought terrible destruction in Alta City. He didn't want to think about what this would do to his city already afraid and demoralized. I would rather not have such an opportunity at that cost, he replied. But Caleth shook his head. It is none of our doing, or of the gods, he said firmly. The Magi have already put all of this in motion, and it will happen whether we use the opportunity or not. They have chosen to besiege the winged ones. The people will come to protest, and they will use the eye, triggering the shake. Then we must make use of it, and take the bitter herb and make a medicine of it, Ari said, standing up. We have a plan. Let us put that into motion. Train your dragons to trust you to be their eyes in the darkness. Easier said than done. And without Ark at ten, it would have been impossible. First, the dragons did not want to be kept from their warm sands when the sun went down. They whined and complained and rebelled as much as if they had been asked to fly in the rain. If Akaten had not been able to tell them it was a needed thing, though she could not explain to them in ways they would understand why it was needed, it would not have been possible to keep them from their pens and well-earned sleep. Second, they truly, passionately, fearfully did not want to fly once the sun was down, even when it was only dusk and not true dark. Because, according to Akaten, Ten, they could not see a quarter of what their humans could see once the brightest light was gone. As they lined up in the last light of day, heads down and tails lashing, their apprehension was so thick Karun could practically taste it. It is the opposite of cats, she said, putting a comforting hand on the quivering shoulder of Rieth Kerr, whose objections to doing this unnatural thing were as strong as any other dragons, despite Akat Ten's constant reassurances in her mind. They may be able to see a mouse from the clouds by day, but they cannot see an elephant at fifty paces once the darkness comes. Karun and Bakken racked their brains to try and devise some training that would lead the dragons to trust in their riders, and in the end, it came down to breaking all of flying down into the simplest parts. First, and hardest, landing in the dark. If they could manage to give their beasts the confidence that they could do this, that they could trust their riders to be their eyes, everything else would follow. They all began by taking their dragons up just as the sun set. Now this was actually an advantage. The dragons could still see, and they were very anxious to be down again. So as soon as the sun disk dropped completely below the horizon, they all allowed their dragons to descend, slowly, very, very slowly, which the dragons were all perfectly fine with. They were having trouble seeing, and were paying, as a consequence, exquisite attention to every tiny nuance of signal that the riders gave them. Then Karun made them take off again, as the dragon boys, now freed from the coming of dark from tending their dragonettes, lit the fires they would use to land by. 
This time it was dusk, not sunset. And not all of them would rise. Karun had figured as much. If they wouldn't, he'd told the others not to force them. Eventually it would come. They might not be able to clearly see the rest of the wing taking off, but they could hear it, and instinct would urge them to do the same. Avatra answered to his order. A measure of her trust in him was that she whined and whimpered, but did not hesitate, though her wing beats were heavy and reluctant. He put her to flying in a slow circle with the fires below at its center. When he peered through the dusk and counted, he found he had been joined in the air by Akhet-Ten and Riyath Ka, Ari and Kashet, and Kalin and Seatman. Ari's Kashet was still visibly blue, even in the dusk. Riyath Ka, however, was hardly more than a shadow with silver edges, and brown and gold Seatman was merely warm shades of gray. That made something else occur to him. It was going to be difficult, if not impossible, to tell each other apart. They would have to have everything perfectly coordinated once darkness fell and stick strictly to the plan. But he could feel Avatra's panic under his legs, in her trembling muscles, and the way she darted her head around, trying to see the other dragons that she could hear. And he knew that she wouldn't rise a third time tonight. She was terrified of a collision in the dark, and rightly so. Of all of them, Kashet was probably the most panicked, because he was the most set in his ways, the least used to being asked to do the unusual. Only the love he had for Ari had driven him into the sky in the first place. Ari! he called in the growing darkness. You down first! Kashet was a wind and a shadow below them, as he spiraled down toward the four fires, for those at least he could see. And he didn't make a graceful landing. It was certainly the clumsiest he'd made since he learned to fly properly. But there were no sounds of disaster, and in the flickering firelight below, Karun made out the dragon shadow scuttling out of the square, clearing it for the next pair. Kalen! he called out, but say Atman having seen, however dimly, one dragon make a safe landing, was already on his way down. You first! Akaten called to him. Riyath Ka will stay as long as I need her to once the sky isn't crowded anymore. He didn't intend to ask twice, for Avatra was straining her head toward the ground, whining anxiously, and he let her follow her instincts and the firelight in a tight spiral down toward the light. But he could feel how much she trusted him and his eyes in the way that she angled her flight to every shift in his weight, and the way she began her back wing instantly when he tugged on the reins. Her landing was much more graceful than Cachette's had been, nearly as good as a daylight landing would have been. He jumped from her back and quickly led her out of the square of light, and none too soon, for not even Akat Ten could hold Riyathka back when she knew she was going to be allowed to land. He didn't wait to watch it. Avatra was straining toward her pen, and he wanted her to have the reward of good work as immediately as possible. She followed his lead through the streets and corridors open to the sky that he had ordered left dark, with no torches or lanterns as were usually in place. The dragons had to learn to place all their trust in what their riders told them, and this was a good, safe way for them to continue the night's lesson. Avatra knew her pen as soon as they stepped across the threshold, and with a cry, she waded out into the sand without waiting for him to unsaddle her. And it just didn't seem fair to make her get out again so he removed her equipment right where she stood, even though he hadn't had to work so hard since the first time he'd unharnessed Cachette. Then he left her to work herself into her wallow, and she was asleep before he'd finished putting the equipment on its racks. He joined the others by prearrangement in Lord Yatirin's kitchen, where they were all enjoying well-earned jars of beer. They hated it, Orest called, spotting him as he came in. They were terrified. If it hadn't been for Arkhat Ten, we'd never have gotten them up. But they did it anyway, Karun pointed out, and four of them actually took off again in the dark and landed a second time. I wish we could try this blindfolded and increase our training time, but we also need them to learn to use what little they can see. Ari, I am amazed Cachette went up for you on the second try. Not half as amazed as I am, Ari replied gulping down half his jar in a single go. 
I think I was almost as frightened as he was. I thought he was going to fly right into you, and so did he. We need more room, Gan said decisively, shaking his head to get the hair out of his eyes. Separate fires. They won't be as frightened if they can't hear other dragons flying so closely above them. That was why Kalef wouldn't rise. He heard the others and dug his talons in and wouldn't move. And I know he was afraid of a collision. So more fires. Or torches, said Asit Ra. Four torches ought to give plenty of light. Good answer. We'll do it, Karan said instantly. Absolutely. If it will make them feel more confident, we'll do anything we have to. Yes, Uras said slowly. I think we will. I think we can do this. He looked around at all of them, that Alton Baker's son who had never been more than two streets away from his home before he'd become a jouster and a rider of one of the first clutch of dragons to be raised from the egg in Alta. I thought you were mad, you and Caleth together. But after tonight, Yes, we can do this. Yes, we can, Ari replied, not quite slamming his empty jar on the table. Yes, by the gods we can. We have to. There's no question. And we will. Fourteen. Ten dragons rose into the hot, late afternoon sky, heading into the west and climbing steeply for as much height as they could get. The higher they were, the less likely it would be that someone on the ground could see riders on the dragons. If anyone, other than the Bedu, saw them, Karun wanted the Watcher to think they were wild. Every bit of this scheme was fraught with peril, and every moment of it contained some potential for mischance. If it went off unthinkably well, no one would know how the Winged Ones escaped. If it all fell to pieces, either the dragons would refuse to fly, or be unable to rescue everyone, or the winged ones would refuse to take to the skies, or someone would find out in advance how they were to get out, and where the refuge was, and seize them as they landed. Realistically speaking, Karan expected their outcome to fall somewhere in between. There wasn't much more that they could do that they hadn't already done to keep everything a secret. Aka Ten's aunt, Ri, had already spread the word that she had taken patience with the pox into her care, and to bolster that tale, several artfully made-up patients, in reality more covert escapees from the city, had been brought by donkey cart to her estate. Interestingly, no one was as yet making any attempt to stop people from leaving the city, so long as they were perfectly ordinary sorts. These were not perfectly ordinary sorts. They were lesser nobles, and had already been turned back once, probably because they tried to leave with everything portable they owned piled up on carts behind them. This time they had smuggled their portable goods out ahead, and themselves out as re patients, rather than trying to leave with all their goods and gear at once. And probably someone would steal some of those possessions on the way, but that was the price they would have to pay to get any of it out. They should count themselves lucky, or so Karun thought to get out with more than their skins and the clothing they stood up in. There was no way of telling if the Magi would have allowed them to leave had they simply walked out on their own two feet without taking all their belongings, or if the Magi didn't care about the goods, but had no intention of allowing any of the city's elite to leave. Forewarned by his children and Caleth, Lord Yatirin had taken the precaution of moving people and goods in small quantities over a period of two fortnights then had made a great show of taking the household, as he often did, to his riverside estate. He had encountered no opposition, but when it was discovered that he was not to be found, perhaps the Magi had decided that there would be no more such defections. The nobles who had been turned back had quickly found one of Lord Kaman's covert agents, who had seen them as the ideal candidates for the initial move of the greater plan of rescue. He had suggested the disguise as pox victims, they had no idea that they were just one more item in a much larger plan. They had arrived at Ri Karun's home several days ago and were already gone, but Ri Karun was keeping up the fiction that she was still tending them. As predicted, no one had ventured anywhere near the boundary of the estate, as marked by the plague marker stones. It was by no means the first time Ri Karun had taken in such people. 
She had a reputation for being able to make amazing cures, and an equal reputation for eccentricity that made people go to her only as a last resort. There were some things not even the Magi could compel a man to face, and the pox was one of them. No one had bothered to follow the donkey carts, and no one was going to go past the plague marker stones until Re Karan herself took them away. Re Karan's son trained horses to pull chariots. He had a huge, bare earth training ground hemmed in on all four sides by a wall for that purpose. That was where the dragons would be landing, just after dark. There were supposed to be fire pots all around the perimeter, and to every third one, some salts of copper had been added to make the flames green and blue. It should be easy to spot, even in the darkness, from the air. Akaten had flown there and back several times to get the timing right, so that they would arrive after darkness fell. It was a good plan. Karun only hoped it would work exactly as they had mapped it out. There were a great many things that were out of their hands. They couldn't predict exactly when the earth shake would strike, for instance, nor how much damage it would do. They couldn't know how visible they would be when they landed on the roof of the temple. And no one knew if the earth shake would be felt as far as Re Karan's estate, or if the dragons would be so frightened by it that they would refuse to make the first flight out that night. Akaten had tried to explain it to them, but this was something that was going to happen in some nebulous future. And dragons were not very good at understanding things like the future. At least Avatra was no longer afraid to fly after darkness fell. She didn't like it, and he didn't blame her, but she wasn't afraid, and she was willing to trust him to keep her safe. In fact, of all the dragons, the only one still showing some fear of flying by night was Kashet. Once again, perhaps because he was the oldest and the least used to changing his ways. But for Ari, he would do anything, and he was certainly proving that now. They were flying right outside of what Kashet considered to be safe territory, known lands, and they were doing it at sunset. Soon enough, it would be dark. It had been no fret's turn to fret tonight. Ari could not be spared from this mission. Kashet, and Kashet alone, was big enough to take some of the heaviest of the winged ones. No fret had not made a scene, but she had been white-lipped and wide-eyed, and her farewell embrace was as fervent as even Ari could have wished. I cannot come this time, she had said as they drew apart. But the next time, I will have my dragon, and I will never leave your side. Karun's shoulders were tight with apprehension, but he tried not to communicate that to Avatra. He actually had to fly without looking in the direction they were going, for the setting sun was straight ahead, and they were flying into it. Instead, he kept his eyes on the ground, judging their height by the landmarks they passed over. Shadows stretched long blue fingers over sands turning ruddy with the light from the setting sun. It was easy to make out every dune, every wind ripple, by the shadows they cast. From time to time he spotted one of the Bedou on a camel, smaller than an ant, standing a motionless guard atop a dune or a ridge. They were there to keep watch over the desert, looking for spies along their path. But they had an advantage that the Magi did not. They had the gods with them, Karan kept reminding himself of that. Thanks to Caleth and the Tians, the Magi could no more use their powers to spy on Sanctuary, or even find it, than Caleth could use his to spy on their councils. They might guess that it existed, but they could not know where, nor could they know how many people had fled to it, and they could have no idea that there were still dragons that answered to the hand of man. And that was their best weapon at the moment. It was a secret that would probably not survive the rescue of the winged ones. But for now, the one direction that the Magi would not look for interference coming from was up. The two most dangerous parts of this mission were the physical landings and takeoffs, and being able to remain hidden at Aunt Rees for the three days they thought it would take to get everyone out. At least the one thing they would not lack was food for the dragons or for themselves for that matter. Ri Karan's estate was very wealthy, so much so that she did not charge for her ministrations. She could afford to be a healer as a hobby. It was that wealth, and her reputation as a doer of good works, as well as the distance from the capital, that had so far kept her safe from the Magi. The shadows below were blending into one another, 
with only the tops of things still gilded with the last light. It was possible to look at the sun now. It was a flattened ball on the horizon, red as a pomegranate. Desert was giving way to marginal land, and Karun could only hope that anyone who saw them would think them a string of swamp dragons going back to their nests along the red and black daughters of Great Mother River. The last of the sun tipped below the horizon as they flew over the first signs of arable land, and Karun saluted the god in his heart, asking in a brief prayer for his blessing. Overhead, the stars on the robe of Nafet, the goddess of night, began to shine. Oh, sweet and gentle one, you who are the keeper of the shadows, make your shadows to hide us from your enemies and ours. He prayed as the sky darkened. Hold your hand above us. Let the night demons go to haunt those who have sent so many needlessly to their deaths, and shelter us from all those who would do harm to us. This was the next tricky part of their journey. They had to find the black daughter before the last light faded, so that they could follow it to re Karan's estate. Karan took a quick glimpse over his shoulder, and with great relief, saw that the nearly full moon was already above the horizon. So at least, once they actually found the river, they'd be able to see it by the moonlight on the water. As the sky turned black and filled with Nafet's jewels, he felt a moment of panic, looking for the black daughter and still not seeing it. And then, at last, a glint of moonlight on the water, and there it was. With what was almost a sob of relief, he turned Avatar to follow it downstream toward the sea, toward Alta once again. The others followed him, like a skein of geese. No fear now that anyone would spot them from below, or know what they saw, if by chance they did catch a glimpse of a shadow crossing the moon. As they winged their way across the star-strewn sky, their dragon's wings making the pattern of three beats and a glide, a feeling that all of this was a dream came over him. It was certainly unnatural. He should not be flying by night. No dragon ever flew by night before. From below came an entirely different set of sounds from those that came up during the day. The song of the nightingale, the barking of dogs, a snatch of song from a hut as they passed over it, and in the distance, the bellow of a river horse. The scent of the river came up to his nostrils, thick, heavy, and very wet, a complicated aroma of mud and weeds, latas and lily, fish and decay. Overpowering for a moment, he had completely forgotten that scent in the relative absence of scent in the desert. It filled him with sudden memories of his first days and nights in Alta, his first days and nights of freedom. It had taken so long to get to Alta City once he had crossed into the lands that Alta claimed. But then Avatra had been young, and not nearly so strong as she was now and they were not going to Alta City. Aunt Ree's estate was one of the farthest from the city on this river. It had taken him most of three days to get to the city. It would take them most of the night to get to Aunt Ree's great house. That was a long time to be flying without thermals to help, but the dragons were all fit and well-fed, and thoroughly rested. There would never be a better time for this. The first lights appeared below marking the homes of farmers, fisherfolk, the occasional great house. Each time Avatra looked longingly toward them and whined, but obeyed when Karun gave her the signal to fly on. This was something they had not been able to train for, but apparently the general habit of obedience was enough. He would have liked to call to the others, but voices carried in the darkness, and voices out of the sky would certainly alert people below. Even if they thought it was ghosts or demons, they might be tempted to peek, so they were maintaining strict silence until they landed. It was a curious thing. He would have thought if there were any such thing as ghosts or night-prowling demons to be seen, they would have been visible from above. Yet there was nothing, or rather, nothing out of the ordinary, though once he did get a glimpse of the astonishing sight of a herd of river horses on land. He would not have thought their ponderous bulk could have been sustained out of the water. The moon passed, slowly and with all the regal deliberation of the goddess that she was, from east to west. The dragons flew on, 
but Karan sensed Avatra growing weary, putting more effort into her wing beats, and he pummeled his brain to try and remember how long Akaten had said it would be before he saw Aunt Ree's fires. And just when he was starting to really worry, he saw them. A welcome sight they were, too. Several furlongs away from the river itself, a blazing rectangle of yellow and blue-green. To his dark-accustomed eyes, the center of the training ground looked as bright as day. And there was no holding Avatra back, either. She spotted it and put on a burst of energy to reach it. Like it or not, she was going to land there. He glanced behind at the eight other shadows ranged in a V-shape from either of Avatra's wings and saw that their dragons, too, had spotted the fires and come to a similar decision. For they, too, had stopped the pattern of three beats and a glide and were plowing through the air with will and determination. It was a very good thing that the training ground was as large as the old landing court in the Jousters' compound in Tia, because there was no holding back any of them. Avatra landed first, but only by the smallest of margins. The rest came in anyhow, picking a spot by virtue of the fact that no one else was in it. In a way, the landing was an anticlimax. While it wasn't done neatly, it was completed with no injuries or collisions. Only when all of them were down, and the dragon's wings were furled and the riders out of their saddles, did anyone emerge from the gate at the end of the training ground. And then, it was not someone, but an entire procession of people, headed by a very formidable-looking woman in a fine if plain wig and an equally fine if plain linen gown. No jewels adorned Aunt Re, but she didn't need them to denote her authority. Her erect carriage, her challenging gaze, and her rather formidable prow of a nose marked her as someone to be reckoned with. But she smiled as Akka Ten ran toward her and flung her arms around her neck and gestured to some of her servants to extinguish the firepots. Where is the wing leader? she called. Stay, he told Apatra, and approached Akka Ten's aunt, giving her a bow of respect when he came within a few paces of her. Well done, boy, she said warmly. That was no easy journey. It was the easiest part of what we are to do, he said somberly, and she nodded in agreement. My people have brought meat for your dragons. Do you wish to remain with them, or would you care to eat in the dining chamber? She asked. Koran ran his hand through his hair and made a rueful face. I think we had rather eat in the dining chamber, but had better remain with our dragons, he replied. They're going to be uneasy enough as it is, and they don't like to be parted from us. He had halfway expected her to be offended, but to his surprise, she broke into an enormous smile. Well said, she exclaimed, clapping her hands together. I like a man who thinks of his beasts and servants comfort before his own. I raised my sons that way, and I cannot count the number of times one of them has declined a feast to sit with an ill or birthing animal and rightly, too, she turned to Akka Ten. You've chosen well, niece. You may keep him. Karun felt himself growing warm, and even though most of the firepots had been extinguished, he saw Akka Ten blushing. No wonder Aunt Re had a reputation for being eccentric, and no wonder the Magi had not challenged her. He rather pitied them if they tried. But she paid no attention to their reactions. Instead, she turned to her servants and gestured, and they began bringing, first wheelbarrows full of meat, then the makings for sleeping pallets, while off to one side, a few more patiently stood, laden with platters of food. The dragons, already exhausted, wolfed down their meat with weary determination to get as much into their bellies as they could before they had to lie down. Each of them chose a place to curl up on hard-packed earth that still held some of the sun's warmth in it. Most of them chose places close together, with only Avatra and Cachette choosing to be a little aloof. Interestingly, Aunt Ree's servants showed no fear of the dragons as they moved about, helping the equally weary riders spread pallets on the ground next to their beasts, then coming to offer them food from the platters. And as Karun made his selections, he felt as if the first part of their ordeal had been well rewarded, for he hadn't seen food like this since they had left Alta. Fresh fruit dripping with juice, 
milk as well as beer to drink, cheese, duck, fish. Oh, fish. He would have felt ashamed to help himself so greedily to the fish, except that he saw out of the corner of his eye that even elegant, aristocratic Gan was digging into the fish with the glee of a sweet-starved child and with as little regard for manners. Aunt Re observed them all with a maternal smile on her face. It does my heart good to see healthy boys enjoying food, she said ostensibly to Akat Ten, but loud enough for them all to hear. The gods put food on this earth for us to appreciate it, and it is blasphemous to do otherwise. And as you can see, I follow that creed. Then she laughed and patted her ample middle. Akaten grinned around a mouthful of palm fruit. Aunt Re, I don't think any of us would disagree with you. And which of these young men is the queen-in-waiting's consort? She asked, and not waiting for an answer, she picked out Ari with her keen eyes. Ah, there you are. Come here, boy, if you would. Ari wisely did as he was told, rising from his cross-legged position on the pallet spread next to Cachette, already dozing, and coming to stand before Aunt Re like a soldier about to be evaluated by his commander. She looked up at him with her arms crossed over her chest and nodded. I like you, Tian, she said. You'll do. It's about time we got someone with some spine in his bloodline on a throne. You see to it that this nonsense is ended once and for all, and crush those vipers calling themselves magi under your heel. And with that, she looked over the rest of them. Get what sleep you can, she said. When the sun rises and it gets too hot for humans, you can either move under the canopies I'll have brought, or come inside. My people will bring you more food for yourselves and your beasts. All you have to do is ask for it. She patted Ari's arm. Back to your dragon before he misses you. And with that, she turned and led her procession of servants back out of the training ground, leaving behind a few lit torches, filled water jars and dippers, and the semi-chaotic sprawl of dragons and riders. Aketen saw to Riefka, who, having been here before, had settled down as soon as she was stuffed full, and now was sleeping blissfully, and flopped down beside Karun. <laughs> Why wasn't that woman on one of the twin thrones? He demanded, half laughing, half seriously. Because she didn't want to be? Akaten grinned. Aunt Re, so far as I can tell, has never had any patience with what she calls trivialities. That's probably why the family put her out here in the first place. According to father, it was a minor estate when she was sent here mostly to keep her from outraging anyone she talked to. She took over the management of it, made it into a very wealthy estate, married her overseer, had six sons, and all of it without asking anyone's permission. Father adores her. You'd either adore her or hate her? He nibbled his lip. I think I adore her too. Has she any magic? Akat Ten shook her head. Not a bit. All of her healing is done with herb and knife, and she's very, very good. When her husband died, she just decided one day that she was going to learn healing, brought in several healers to teach her, and just absorbed it all the way dry ground absorbs rain. But why healing? he persisted. I don't know. She only told me that no other man could ever fill her life the way we Ra Te did. So she wasn't going to try to find another husband, that the estate was pretty much running itself, and what little it needed ought to be her eldest son's purview anyway. So she needed something that would fill her thoughts and her time, if not her life. Akatin shrugged. If you were going to ask me, I'd say it was probably something she'd wanted to do before she was sent here, and wasn't allowed. She's a wonder, Karun said, looking at the gate through which she had exited. She's every bit of that, Akaten yawned. Now I want to sleep. If that earthshake comes tomorrow, we'll need all the rest we can get. Karun nodded, looked around, and saw that pretty much everyone else had come to the same conclusion. Ari was already asleep, with his hand on Cachette's foreleg. The others had curled up at various other positions of contact with their dragons, 
each taking comfort from the other in this strange place. Akaten bent and softly kissed his forehead before taking herself to her own pallet, and he found the most comfortable position for himself, with his back against Avatra's belly. Sleep was a long time in coming. As he played over in his mind all the possible variations the rescue could have, and tried to think of others that hadn't yet occurred to him. But eventually sleep did come, and took all further thoughts and plans away. 15. The dragons slept like so many statues, and for a while so did their riders, until the sun rose a bit too far, and it was too hot for a human to take, even those used to the heat of the desert. As the riders woke one by one, the dragons roused just enough to eat, but went back to sleep immediately. Karun worried about turning their night and day all around about for them, but there really wasn't a choice, not if they were going to have any hope at all of rescuing the winged ones. Still, as he stumbled with the rest to the shelter of the canopies Aunt Ree's servants had erected, stomach a bit queasy, thoughts fogged, and head aching, he wondered, if the humans felt this unsettled, how did the dragons feel? He fell asleep again almost as soon as he'd had a drink and gotten into the shade, as had the rest. The rest. They were flat as dried-up lizards on their low Alton couches, made to stand as near to the ground and the cooler air near the floor as possible without actually being on the floor. It probably would have been cooler inside, but none of them wanted to leave the dragons. He woke again, feeling much more clear-headed, to the sound of quiet voices, and levered himself off the couch to see that it was mid to late afternoon, and Aunt Ree was deep in conversation with Ari. Asit Ra was cleaning his harness, Gan, Peatep, and Orist were feeding their dragons. Only Kalin, Huras, and Aket Ten still slept. His mind felt immensely clearer, and the dragons looked quite their normal selves. In fact, Avatra caught the slight movement he made in looking up, and raised her head to snort at him in that demanding fashion that told him she wanted food and she wanted it now. The others were being fed, and here he was asleep. Aunt Ree glanced over at the imperious scarlet beauty and chuckled. He knuckled the last sleep out of his eyes and got up to obey her, nudging the couches of Aket Ten and Huras as he passed to stir them up. Kalin was already blinking, looking as ruffled as an owl awakened during the day. It was all so peaceful. It was easy to forget the situation that brought them here, the crisis that was building within an easy flight of this place, the war, the magi, and everything else. He asked one of the waiting servants to bring him meat for Avatra, and trundled the waiting barrow to her with a pang of regret. This was a very temporary respite in a terrible conflict, and he found himself longing for this peace as much as starving little Vetch had longed for food. Avatra bent her head to the barrow of meat and, rather than gulping down the chunks as he had expected she would, ate them daintily, as she had an Alta, slowly, as if savoring the fleeting moment herself and trying to make it last. By the time she was done, the rest had all finished feeding, even Riethka. None of the others was willing to linger over a meal, however tasty, and as the servants filled the horse troughs so that the dragons could get a drink, they all, even Avatra, kept their heads up, looking about warily, as if expecting something. Even when they were all led to the water, they would not all drink at the same time but took it in turns to keep watch for something only they could sense. And Karun wondered, had the Magi employed the eye, as Caleth had said they would? Could the dragons sense the horror scorching down out of the tower out there? Caleth's vision had shown it happening late some afternoon, but there was no telling which afternoon it would be. They had picked the most likely, but it could come tomorrow, or the day after that, or yet another day and part of him wanted desperately to put the hour off, but the rest of him wanted just as desperately to get it all over with. Whatever was causing them to be wary, the dragons didn't settle down completely once they'd drunk. Not even a rub down and a brisk oiling made them give over that constant looking around for something that no one else could sense. Akaten could only say, They're uneasy, they're on edge, and they don't know why which was obvious enough even to anyone without the ability to speak with them. The boat of the sun sank to the horizon, and still they would not settle. 
even though their instincts were surely telling them it was getting on time to sleep. The servants reported that none of the other animals around the estate were keyed up, with the single exception of Aunt Ree's pet cheetah, who was prowling the confines of her special chamber with the same wary urgency with which the dragons were prowling the training grounds. And just as the sun disk sank out of sight, everything suddenly went very, very quiet. Too quiet. Not a goose honked, not a bird sang, not even a single insect buzzed or rattled. The hair suddenly rose on the back of Karun's neck, and he felt cold all over, and instinctively looked around for something to clutch. The dragons went rigid. Then it came. That moment of silence warned them, and they had braced themselves, but it was still gut-wrenching. When the ground below one moves, the body automatically reacts, sharply, and with the most acute of terror. And this was no ordinary shake, for it went on for what seemed like an eternity. It was not bad as such things went. In fact, it was no worse than many such that Karun had felt before the Magi began employing the eye on a regular basis. But it went on and on and on, while humans and animals alike screamed with atavistic fear, while birds exploded up into the darkening sky, calling alarm at the tops of their lungs, and the dragons ramped and snorted and hissed, clustering close until their heads and long necks formed a bizarre, ever-weaving bouquet. Under the crash of things falling over, pottery breaking, cries and howls and screams, was another sound, deep, that rattled the chest and the gut. It was more than the worst thunder he had ever heard, a moaning of earth and stone providing the drumming of this dance of disaster. The voice of the earth shake was like the groan of an earth wounded near to death. But only Kalef lifted off, and even then, not for long, only for a moment, and he sat down again in spite of the fact that the ground was still heaving. Nearly all of them had dropped to their knees, not because it was hard to keep their footing, but because the terror that welled up inside them made it impossible to stand. Only Ari and Aunt Ri remained on their feet, and Karun could not imagine how they were coping with abject fear that made his insides turn to water and his muscles to dough. They felt it. He could see it on their faces, yet they were holding against it. The shake continued to go on and on for far too long, until he could scarcely think or see, hardly draw a breath for the terror that tightened his chest. Then, as abruptly as it had begun, it stopped, leaving behind only the cacophony of birds, the terrified whinnying of horses from the stables and paddocks beside the training ground, and the hissing and whining of the dragons. Karun picked himself up and went to Abitra to calm her. Around the courtyard, the rest were doing the same. Out of the corner of his eye he saw Aunt Ri going to her servants, one after the other, helping them up, giving them a maternal pat here, a bit of a shake there, a shove to get them moving again. Knew it was coming, she said briskly as she moved into his range of hearing. Now we need to find out the damage. Come on, come on. We don't want to find river horses trying to take shelter in the duck pond now, do we? Even as he was calming Avatra, he had to admire her. She was like a general mustering the courage of her troops. I'm glad she's on our side, he said to Akhet Ten, who had quickly gotten Rieth Ka under control, and was now working her way around the other dragons bestowing calm with a touch, a silent word, or both. She gave him a shaky smile, her teeth flashing whitely in the growing darkness, but said nothing. By this time the birds had settled again, and though there was anxious complaining from the trees around the house, there was no more shrieking. Those that could still see in the half-light had flown off, the rest had no choice but to settle down. Someone was getting to the horses, too. They were calming. We have to go, he realized, still numb with the aftershock. This is it. We have to go, and soon. It wasn't long before Aunt Ree had her servants out of the training ground and back in again, bringing back those fire pots. They placed the pots exactly as they had for the dragon's arrival, and Karan was grateful. Aunt Ree must have understood it would be impossible to get the dragons up into the air without light now. He only hoped it would be possible to get them up into the air with light. 
With hands that still shook more than a little, he saddled and harnessed Avatra, while the servants placed and lit the firepots, lighting up the training ground with a welcome golden glow. Light seemed to make everything safer. This made no sense at all, of course, because an overturned firepot was more danger than the earth shake, but there was no reasoning with feelings. The dragons certainly felt that way, though given how little they could see in the dark, their reaction was perfectly understandable. The question was, after that shake, could he possibly induce them to leave this safe haven of light? Well, there was only one way to find out, and this time, Akaten would have to lead the way. If she could get Rieth Ka up, the rest would surely follow. He whistled the signal to mount. A little raggedly, they all got into their saddles. He looked over to Aket Ten, met her dark, serious gaze, and nodded. It was up to her now. From here on, she would lead the way, and it would all be done by the numbers. Rayeth Ka, she called, her voice sounding a little high and shrill. Up! And as if she could not shake the dust of the treacherous earth from her talons swiftly enough, Rayeth Ka leaped into the deepening blue of the sky. He didn't have to do more than lift his reins to signal Avatra. She was up like a shot, and she must have been taking comfort in a routine she had practiced until it was second nature. Perhaps, like the birds, she felt that safety was in the air, not the ground. As she labored higher, her sides heaving under his legs and growing warmer with exertion with every wing beat, he glanced behind to see that Kalef was already airborne as well, and was Stet leaping upward with wings outstretched. Beneath them, in Aunt Ree's compound, there was ordered activity. He could not see much damage, although things like cracked walls would not be visible until daylight. But servants were going here and there, gathering children together for comfort, moving pallets out into open spaces for safety if there were aftershakes, seeing that beasts were secure, tending to the few, remarkably few he was relieved to see, injured. Outside her estate, however, as the full moon crested the horizon and spread her cold light over the fields, the case was otherwise. People ran here and there with torches, without really seeming to know where they needed to go. He saw collapsed farmhouses, broken walls, cattle, goats, and pigs running loose. There were fires, too, and shouts and weeping came up to them on the night air. It made him angry that because there was a greater need for them in Alta's city, they could not stop to help here. He could only hope that Aunt Ree had already considered that, and when her estate was secure, would send her people out to help her neighbors. Meanwhile, the river beckoned, a long, flat silver ribbon in the moonlight, and their guide to their goal. But it was not the serene river it had been last night. There was a taste of mud and ancient muck in the air. The animals voiced their own outrage. River horses bellowed their anger from among the pools and backwaters, and crocodiles roared and thrashed as they fought with each other or caught, while he only hoped they were catching some luckless farmer's terrified stock, and not the farmer's children, or the farmer himself. The closer they came to the outer canal and the seventh ring, the worse the damage, and the greater the chaos and now it was physically painful to see from the air what he had not been able to see the night of his first experience of earthshake. There were fires everywhere, and not just shouts and weeping, but real screaming coming up from below. He could see places where buildings had canted over and fallen sideways, or where they had sunk up to the roof line, as if the ground had turned to water beneath them. And that shook him. There had been nothing like that before. What had they done? Not us, he reminded himself desperately. We didn't do this. We didn't trigger it. We didn't ask for the riot that made the Magi use the eye. All we did was take advantage of what the gods showed us the people would do, and the Magi would do, and what would come of it. It wasn't our fault, and we couldn't have stopped it. But his insides were not convinced. The shake must have been terrible indeed to have reached this far. Up until now, the worst damage had been confined within the first three rings, and what could have made the ground behave in that strange fashion to swallow up whole buildings? Ahead of him, the dark silver gilt shadow that was Riyathka flew steadily onward. Behind him trailed the rest of the wing, 
or at least the rest of it up to Orest and Wastet. A new concern. How many of them had made it into the air? They passed the sixth ring, the fifth. Then, at the fourth ring, though there were still fires, was still shouting and crying and chaos, there was, unaccountably, less of it. And at the third ring, there was order again, and he could have shouted with relief. Not surprising, this was where the military were housed and trained. But still, to look down and see people dealing with the aftermath of the earth shake with the same calm as Aunt Ree's people made him feel considerably less guilty. The second ring, and again, there did not seem to be the same amount of chaos and catastrophe as in the outer rings, although there was certainly more than enough. And it suddenly dawned on him why. So much damage had been wrought here already by the shakes before they had left, as well as the ones after, that almost everything that could be knocked down had been, and many people were probably sleeping in the open at night out of hopeless resignation. For some reason, that realization transmuted his feelings from guilt into anger, and if he could have gotten his hands around the throat of the Magus just then, he'd have throttled any one of them without a second thought. This was what they had brought the great city-state of Alta to, this state of helpless apathy, this fear that drained even the ability to properly feel fear, this crawling wretchedness not even a slave would envy. You worms! he thought angrily up at Royal Hill. You vermin! You scorpions that eat your own young! How dare you do this! May the gods help me to bring you down for it! But ahead of them, among the many buildings that were damaged, or a fire, or ominously dark and silent, stood one he knew well. The Temple of the Twins, and though its ornamental pools were cracked and empty, and some of its statues and columns toppled, the building itself stood strong, and visible only from above, there was a carefully laid-out square of torches on the roof. As they drew nearer, he could see people up there, too, and after all that devastation below, his heart rose a little to see that the plan they had made in faith was being carried out in fact. Now it all depended on the dragons, if they would remember and stick to the drill, even though the drill had taken place amid calm and without all the screaming, the fires, and the upset from the shake. They had paced out the dimensions of the temple. They had plotted it and the grounds around it on the earth in a pattern of stones. And now, as Karun watched, Ryethka banked slightly to take herself and Akit Ten down to that lighted rooftop, not nearly as well lit as Aunt Ree's training ground, but it would have to do, because it was all they had. And as Ryethka banked, he took Avatra to one corner of that rough square they had paced out, marked by a clump of date palms, a square whose dimensions were large enough that eight or nine dragons could fly the perimeter in the darkness and not be afraid of collisions. By the numbers, he reminded himself, and began to count under his breath. By the numbers, because they would not necessarily be able to see when each of them landed and took off again. The first count of thirty took him to the second corner of the square. He risked a glance at the rooftop as Avatra made a sharp left-hand bank, and thought he saw Ryethka was safely down. The next count took him to the third corner, and he searched the sky at his own height for the dark-winged shadows of the others. Yes, one, two. He counted up to eight and let out a strangled cheer that would surely be lost in the noise below. They had all followed from Aunt Ree's estate. It was working. One more count of thirty, and a glance at the roof showed it was empty of anything but people. Abitra made her turn as neatly as if they were practicing over sanctuary. A long, shallow glide down over the square of torches, a thunder of wings, and a wind that made the flames stream sideways as she came into a halt, the moment of fumbling hesitation beneath him as she felt for a secure talon hold. And then... Then she was down. She barely had time to pull in her wings, and he didn't get time to draw a breath before someone, with a pale blur of a face wrapped in a dark cloak, shoved two smaller objects wrapped in equally dark cloth at him. Children. Nestlings, probably, not even old enough to be fledglings, and their inert limpness made him go stiff with rage. But he wasted no time on speech. He couldn't hold them and fly. 
so he belted them to himself before and behind the saddle with the straps they handed to him silently. Below this place, weeping and cries of pain. Here, only silence, as if he was being served by shadows and ghosts. And once they were secure, he gave Avatra the signal, and they were away. Avatra seemed to have picked up on some of his emotion, however, for he could feel a new energy in her flight as they sped away into the darkness, deliberately going higher to take them above the flying square of dragons. As they neared Aunt Ree's estate, he thought he caught sight of Aket Ten and Rieth Ke coming back, and once again he gave a little exclamation of triumph. This was the second sticking point. Having come back to the safe haven, could the dragons be persuaded into the air again? Rieth Ke at least could be. They landed, and eager hands reached for the children, swarming over Avatra like cleaner birds over a river horse. She seemed to have grasped the serious nature of what they were doing now. She stood as patiently as anyone could have wished while strangers crowded her and treated her like nothing more than a living cart while getting the children unstrapped. Then, at last, they were free again, and Avatra took to the sky without a moment of hesitation. As they made height, he definitely caught sight of Kashat coming in, though he could not tell what kind of burden he and Ari carried, and then he passed the others, one at a time, really knowing who they were only by their order. Wastet and Orest, Dioth and Peatep, Apetma and Aset Ra, Kalef and Gan, Bethlen and Manet Ka, and last of all, the steadiest and strongest of the lot after Kashet and Avatra, Big Tathulan and Huras. Now, if they would all make the second trip and not refuse, and if no one saw them or realized what they were seeing if they did, only when he had formed up the second square did he know for certain that the plan was working in its entirety, and Avatra seemed to have been set afire by the urgency of what they were doing. She came in with the speed and snap she had when she was making a kill when hungry. She stood like a rock as the next to be rescued was helped onto her back. This time, though it was another pair of children, these must have been fledglings, and they were able to cling to him and not be bound to him like inert bundles, though they were secured with straps. Avatra was in the air almost before the last of the winged ones was out of the way, and the two children gasped as she rode for height. Halfway to Aunt Rees, the one behind him tugged at his tunic. Jousta! came a thin, pathetic little whisper. Are you taking us away from the Magi? Far away, he called back, over the steady, strong flapping of Avatra's wings. Far, far away, where the sand of the desert will hide you, and the swords of the Bedu will guard you, and they will never, ever find you again. Both children burst into tears of pure release, reaching for one another's hands on either side of him, and it was all he could do to keep from joining them. Instead, he pointed out the white egrets in the tops of the trees they flew over, a pair of fighting river horses, the reflection of the moon on the river, the pattern of the stars. Anything except the places where people were still trying to save themselves and their property below. His distraction must have been effective. They listened and watched, and most importantly, stopped crying. They began again as soon as he handed them over to Aunt Ree's people, but at that point they were no longer his concern and he had to concentrate on the next trip, and the next, and the next. Avatra had never flown so strongly, but by the fourth trip, they had lost Dioth to exhaustion, not to unwillingness, because he tried to take off, but Peatep was too wise to let him. Apetma simply dropped, so tired she simply couldn't rise. By the fifth, say Atman, Wastet, and Bethlen were out too, and on the sixth, Poor Kalef and Tethulan were so tired their wings were trembling. That left only Karun and Avatra, Ari and Kashet, and Aketen and Riyath Ka for the seventh and final trip of the night. Kashet had carried double every time. Probably Aketen's lighter weight was what had made it possible for Riyath Ka to carry on to the end, but she was lagging on that final leg, and as they actually flew into the gray of pre dawn, Halfway back to Aunt Ree's compound, Cachette and Avatra caught up with her. Ari and Karun exchanged a glance, and Cachette pulled into the lead, allowing Riyathka and Avatra to fall back into the wake position off his left and right wings. 
It was easier flying there. He could see Riethka's breathing ease a little. With plenty of light to see by, they all landed together too, letting down their exhausted passengers into the hands of equally exhausted servants, who bustled them off before the jousters were even out of their saddles. The rest of the dragons and their riders were already dead asleep, and from the look of them, not even another earthshake would wake them. But Karun found himself being helped in unsaddling Avatra by a handsome, muscular young man with the powerful upper torso of a charioteer, who had also come wheeling up a heaped high barrow of meat that Avatra began wolfing down without waiting to be unharnessed. You've gotten out eighteen nestlings, he said without preamble, raising his voice enough so that Ari and Akat Ten could hear. That was the first trip. You got out twice that many fledglings on the second and third trips. Another six fledglings and three winged ones on the fourth, six winged ones on the fifth trip, five on the sixth, and three on the seventh trip, which is three more trips than anyone ever thought you'd make in their wildest dreams. Karun tried to add the total up in his mind, and felt the numbers slipping through his mind like the yolk from a broken egg. Um, sixty, ah, uh, seventy-seven, the young man corrected him. One more night and you'll have all the winged ones out. If you want to try for three nights, you can probably evacuate the servants that are left too. Harun looked over at Ari, and rubbed a gritty hand over his forehead. I think we should, Ari said firmly. The dragons are clearly willing, and I don't want to leave anyone to suffer back there. There was something intensely bitter and angry in Ari's tone as he said that, something that cast Karun back in time to a moment when he had heard Ari cry out, I do not make war on children. It rocked him back on his heels, and he stared at Ari wide-eyed. Ari stared back. There are some things, he said, that no man can countenance. Someone told him something. Maybe more than one someone. Well, Ari was the only one with a dragon strong enough to carry the largest of the adults. Once the youngest had been gotten out, surely the next to go would have been the very oldest. No one had been draining the winged ones for several days now, which meant some of them would have started to recover their powers. They had to have recovered their wits, or they would never have been able to barricade themselves in the temple. If one of them recognized Ari for what he was and it would take a winged one no more than an unguarded touch to do that, then they would have known that their rescuer was also the titular king of sanctuary. So of course they told him something. They probably told him everything they could before they were set down. He's the king. He has to know. It was one thing to be told in abstract that the magi were draining the god-touched, damaging them, sometimes killing them. Karun suspected that it was quite another thing to be told what it was like, by someone who had experienced it, day after day, for the last year. Well, that was a good thing. If Ari had any doubts about what he should do, they were gone now. But Karun was very, very glad that he was not the one who'd had to hear those tales. Truth be told, he already knew more than was comfortable. Mother is sending the strongest of them off today, the young man continued the clue telling Karun that his helper was the horse-training son of Aunt Ri, which explained his family resemblance. But they will be very, very glad to hear that you intend to evacuate the entire temple. I'll go tell them now. Do that, Ari said, and managed a wan smile. And meanwhile, I think we had better emulate our wingmates. Avatra was already doing just that dropping down where she stood after swallowing a last mouthful of meat. With a groan, Cachette did the same. Riethka looked about and went to curl up beside Tathulan, then changed her mind and put her back up against Avatra, who didn't even stir. Ari raised an eyebrow at Karun, who was too tired to even blush. More servants brought them meat, onions, and soured milk wrapped in flatbread and jars of beer that they ate and drank while pallets were spread beside their dragons. Then, like their dragons, they dropped down to sleep, and did not awaken until their dragon's hunger roused everyone. 16. He had thought they had slept like the dead yesterday. That was nothing compared with today. 
Even an earthshake didn't wake them, for they did get a minor rumble, and neither he nor any of the others was aware there had been one until they clawed their way up out of slumber. He didn't even remember stumbling his way to a couch in the shade when the sun grew too hot. He only knew he had gone to sleep beside Avatra and woke once again on the couch, and not even the same one as the last time. But when he woke, it was with a rush, and he woke all at once, out of a dream of flying winged ones off the roof of the temple, burning with a desire to get more of them away before the Magi understood what was happening. He didn't sit up with a yell, though he might as well have. He startled the servant who was sitting beside him, but the boy recovered quickly. It is not yet time, Master, he said, before Karan could say anything. You have time to see to your dragon, to bathe and eat. There was another small shake after dawn. Did you feel it? He shook his head, but his attention was caught by a single word. Bathe. At the sound of that word, Karan itched all over. Not that there wasn't water enough to bathe at sanctuary, but it seemed wrong to use so precious a thing for bathing. They all did, of course, but it seemed wrong. Now the hot spring at Corson's nest was another matter entirely, but he hadn't had a bath there since two days before this journey. But this was Alta, where water was abundant, so after he saw Avatra fed, he allowed the servant to take him off to the baths, both hot and cold and once re-clothed in a common tunic of the sort Aunt Re gave her upper servants, which was enough like what the jousters wore these days that it made no difference, he helped himself to the food left out for all of them and made a hasty meal. Akaten was the last of the riders to wake, and he didn't blame her for sleeping so long. She had been doing two jobs at once, guiding her own dragon and keeping track of all the rest of them. She woke just as quickly as he had when she finally did break through her slumbers and was just as impatient to be gone as the rest of them. She surely imparted that impatience to the dragons, all ten of them, for the moment she came awake, they began to fidget and look skyward. And at that moment, Karun would have given all that he had, or ever hoped to have, for one flight, just one, with all the wings that Alta had once had. With that many dragons, they could have left now, to arrive just after sunset, and it wouldn't matter who saw them. The Magi couldn't use the eye at night, and they would have been able to pull out every last person all at once. But dragons had no mystical ability to go back or forward in time, so the wing he had was all he was going to get. And as soon as Akhet-Ten had rejoined them, hair plastered flat to her skull from her bath, he called a meeting. Last night was the easy one, he told them. That Orist's indignant stare shook his head. Yes, I know. From just the point of view of uncertainty about whether we'd get the dragons up at all, it was the hard one. But in terms of getting people out, it was the easy one. He tilted his head to the side, then lifted his head and looked each of them in the eyes. Think about it. We had it all our own way last night. The Magi were busy making sure of their own safety and didn't give a toss about anyone else. We got out the children, the old and the sick, all of them lightweight, all of them tractable. Or unconscious, Gan said soberly, raking his fingers through his hair to help it dry. You have a good point, though. Easy to fly, and they didn't make a fuss or scream or anything. Tonight, we get the able-bodied and the heaviest. But there's more to it than that, he replied. The people we take out tonight are the senior winged ones, ruling priests, important priestesses. They're used to giving orders and having them obeyed. What possible orders could they give? Payatab asked incredulously. Fly faster? As if we could. Osset Ram made a face and shook his head. They're great lords and ladies in their own right. Who knows what they'll demand when we are airborne? Karun silently applauded Osset for seeing at once where the danger was. He was very aware of Aunt Rhee standing off to one side, listening, but not commenting. We are very young men, all looking rather like servants, and one young woman with what is, by their standards, a minor power, who should by all rights rank just about fledgling status. They won't think when they see us. If they aren't too sick and tired to do anything but hang on, there is no telling what they might try to order us to do. 
Fly lower, squeaked Gan in an imperious old lady voice, swatting at Peatep. Aunt Re hid a smile behind her hand. He nodded. Now he had to remind them of what they were, and that they had to disobey. Or higher, certainly faster or slower. And while you might be able to fob them off by telling them the dragons can't do that, there's other things they might want you to do. Stop, because I must get this or that treasure or sacred object. Land there to tell my mother I'm safe, he shrugged. There's no telling, but they might well become real nuisances, some of them, when they're in the air. They've been powerless a long time. They'll want to command something, if only us. Trouble. Horace shook his head. You don't think they'll go so far as to fight us, do you? For that, he had to look to Akit Ten and Orist. Akit Ten shook her head. I think they'll be torn between the excitement of escape and the fear of being captured. But they might start to shout, and voices coming from the sky might not be a good idea. Try telling them no matter what they want, it's Lord Command's orders, Orist offered. Most of them know they could half-bully father, but nobody's ever gotten around Lord Kamun, not even a winged one. Well, if it came to that, Lord Kamun was going to end up with an earful when they finally got to Sanctuary. Lord Kamun can take care of himself, he decided. I just want you to keep those things in mind, he went on. First, heavier passengers. Second, passengers who want to make demands. And three, he paused. We don't know what the Magi have done in our absence, nor what they might do after darkness falls. Maybe they'll still be too concerned with their own safety and comfort after so big a shake that they won't keep a magical eye on the temple. But I don't think we can count on that. Do you? One by one, the others shook their heads. Overhead, vultures circled on the thermals their dragons would be using, if only they could, dared fly by day. At least, darkness would hide them in part. Until they came in to pick up the first escapees. Until they came into the light. So tonight, we run the risk of being seen. He chewed on his lower lip. I don't think there's anything we can really do about that. Not being overlooked by magic, anyway. Uh, Akaten flushed, and held up a fistful of leather thongs. I think these might help. He peered at them, frowning. There were little faience medallions hanging from them. They looked familiar. Pachette's teeth! exclaimed Osset Ra with delight. Herclatus's amulets! He jumped to his feet, pulled Akaten up, whirled her around like a child, and kissed her on the top of the head before letting her drop back down again, flushed and laughing. Here, she said, passing them out. I collected them after we came to Sanctuary. You lot kept losing them or leaving them lying around, and there's no point in discarding something magic, even if you don't need it at the time. I thought they might be useful again. Heclatus knows I have them, and I told him I was taking them along. He said it was a good thing, otherwise he'd have to make a new batch and send them along, and I saved him the work. Karan accepted the amulets with a rueful shrug. Once in the safety of Sanctuary, he'd been one of the worst at forgetting to keep track of his amulets. Heclatus had made them to interfere with the Magi's scrying, or seeing at a distance, back when they were all in the Jouster's compound together. But although the protection had been priceless while they were scheming to destroy the Tala and escape right under the Magi's noses, they had seemed of little utility out in the middle of the trackless desert, where the distance and Caliph's god-assisted protections kept them from being overlooked by means of magic. But Akaten never forgot anything, it seemed. All right, then he said, pulling the thong over his head. We can keep them from seeing us with magic, but we can't stop someone from spotting us just by looking up. So we have to assume they will have eyes in the city, especially eyes keeping watch on the temple, and those eyes will report whatever they see, even if it's dragons where no dragons should be. Osset Russ snorted, and behind him, her neck arched so that her head was right above his. Coppery Petma snorted so exactly like him that, Serious as the situation was, it startled a laugh out of all of them. <laughs> Especially dragons where no dragons should be, you mean? Osetra said. No, you're right. Those miserable crocodiles wouldn't spare a man to help a single person on the outer rings. But once they're certain of being comfortable and safe, 
They'll put spies back on the temple. He thrust out his jaw belligerently. All the more reason to get out as many tonight as we can. We know what to do now. Which is, above all else, to not let your dragons fly past their strength. Karan glared at him. You can't afford to go to ground between here and the temple. But it did come to me that if a dragon were to stop at round three or four, but regain enough strength to join the final round, it would be important enough to let him or her do so. But you must judge your dragon's strength to the last wingbeat. Failure on the return leg, he shook his head, landing in the dark or in the river, with the crocodiles and the river horses so excited and upset by the earth shake. Most of them had seen men hurt or killed in a river horse hunt. All had seen the injuries men got from the seemingly soft and passive beasts. And a crocodile, or worse yet, a swarm of them, they'd take a man and a dragon to pieces in moments. Swamp dragons could hold their own against both river horse and crocodile, but these were desert dragons and utterly unsuited to such foes. No, we can't afford that, Kalin agreed. And I've got a horrible truth for you. There are a lot more winged ones than there are justers. We cannot go into this certain that we will get them all out. We must try, but we might not be able to. If someone has to be left behind, it had better not be a jouster. Akat Ten made a little cry of protest, but Ari nodded, and so did Karun. An ugly truth, too. And that is what, as your wing leader, I am ordering you to do. If it comes to that, he said, making his voice as hard as he could manage. There are ten of us, and already we have saved six times that number of winged ones. I can't replace one of you. I can probably replace a winged one. Agreed? Akatin's face crumpled, and she looked utterly miserable. But glancing at Ari gave her no reprieve, so reluctantly she nodded. With luck, it won't come up, he said, injecting a little cheer into his tone. Haras give us strength and luck. We'll succeed despite their ill will. Can anybody think of anything else? No one could, so at that point it was just a matter of waiting. Just. If there was anything harder than waiting, he certainly didn't know what it was. The passenger was an imperious old woman, with a voice so exactly like Gan's imitation that he had to catch himself to keep from laughing aloud. Fly faster, she demanded in his ear. At least she was making an effort to keep her commands quiet. Dragon's flying as fast as she can, great lady, he replied, taking a moment to remind himself who these people were and how much respect they were due. And he heard the fear under the arrogance. Perhaps the arrogance was born of fear. He wanted that respect in his voice before he answered her. None of them are used to carrying double. The old woman mulled that over for a bit, then poked him in the ribs with a bony finger. Then land beside Te Atenka's apothecary shop on Fourth Ring. I need... I'm sorry, great lady, but no landing until we get to Re Caron's estate in the country, he interrupted. Lord commands orders. Even if I knew where the place was, which I don't, and even if it's still standing when we got there, which it probably isn't, what Lady Re Caron doesn't have, you'll have to do without until you can find a way to get it. She bristled forgetting her fear in the shock of being thwarted by a mere boy. He could feel her back behind him, bristling up with indignation like a hedgehog. Now see here, young man, I will not. Great lady, I'm afraid you must, he interrupted again. What you don't have, you will have to do without, and anyone you wish to speak with to assure them of your safety will have to go unwarned. Avatra is not like a chariot. If you seize the reins, you will only confuse and upset her. And if you upset her, she may well decide you are too much trouble to carry. Astonished silence followed that revelation. But, she began again, this time with more uncertainty in her voice. Great lady, can you swim? Karun interrupted again. Because if Avatra decides to rid herself of you, there is very little I can do about it. But at least we will be above the great Mother River's daughter most of the way. Behind him, he sensed that the old woman was opening and closing her mouth silently, like a fish pulled up on the bank. Well, she could do whatever she wanted as far as he was concerned, as long as she made no noise. 
Her shock kept her silent the rest of the way. When he handed her down to her waiting attendants, she looked up as if she was about to say something, but didn't get a chance to before they rushed her away. The next trip, the man they put up behind him was silent and looked exhausted. He said not a word until they landed, and then it was only a whispered, Thank you, as he dismounted. The third trip, however, and the passenger being a tall, cadaverous-looking man with haunted eyes, the ones who helped him strap himself to Karun looked faintly familiar, enough so that he glanced back in puzzlement as Avatra took off. Think you know them, do you? The winged one said in his ear. You probably do. They were two of your little friend Akat Ten's teachers. But they weren't wearing the medallions of the winged ones, his mind protested. He didn't say it aloud, but he had forgotten for a moment that with these people, he didn't have to say something aloud to be heard. They aren't winged anymore, the bitter man said in a tone of venomous anger. Not winged? But that wasn't possible. Surely you were either winged or not. They fought the Magi. The Magi didn't like that, so they kept the ones who fought instead of letting them come back to the temple to rest and use them until they burned them out. Unfortunately for them, they didn't die of it. Not only hatred, but fear, and the kind of anger that gripped Karun like the talons of a vulture. Then, the Magi brought them back as a lesson to the rest of us. They're no more God-touched now than you are. At least they're alive, Karun offered, feeling it was a weak solace, but still. They were alive when all those acolytes in Tia weren't. They might not be winged anymore, but thousands of people weren't winged. I wouldn't call it living, the bitter man said, acid etching every word. A man can live without a hand, a foot, even an eye. But what happens when you take part of what he is? He's better off dead. I'd say that, and they'd say the same. Karun had no good response for that. There was no good response for that. All he could do was to guide Avatra through the night, and wonder what, if anything, the angry man thought he could do about it. I'm sorry. Seemed a bit inadequate, but it was all he had. The man didn't say anything more until they reached the estate and landed. Then, once he was down on the ground, he gave Karun a searching gaze. You're a good lad, he said. Just do what you came to do as best you can. And don't take more on yourself than you can be responsible for. And with that, he staggered away, limping heavily and leaning on the arm of an attendant. And if there had been time, Karun would have hurried after him to demand a meaning for such cryptic remarks. But there wasn't, and he didn't. And Avatra was already off the ground as he wrenched his gaze back to the direction of Alta City. When he picked up the seventh passenger of the night, there were people bringing heavy coils of rope up to the top of the building. And as he took off with the man, he and Ari were getting the men, of course, since their dragons were the oldest and biggest. The winged one kept looking back. Karun followed his gaze and saw that the rope had been tied off to some ornamental stonework, and someone was just slipping over the edge to climb down. That's a relief, his passenger said, turning back to face forward. I'm glad to see someone talked sense into them. Talked sense into who? Karan asked. Some of the servants, young ones, who actually have the strength to go down a rope like a monkey. The man sighed. With two-thirds of us gone, there's no need for all of the servants, and there's no telling what they're up to, spying on us, I've no doubt. If they discover that some of us are gone, they'll try and break the siege. And we've been telling the servants that there's no odds, one way or another, on whether you'll be able to get them out before the Magi and their guards turn up. Someone must have talked them around to going out over the wall. It's what I'd do, Karun agreed, if I wasn't needed. They aren't, and if the Magi guess what's happening, they're likely to get... The man paused, choosing his words carefully. Vindictive. Vindictive. Karun didn't like the sound of that. Would they turn the eye on the temple? He asked, feeling his stomach sink with dread. But the answer he got reassured him. They can't. Once they use it, they have to recharge it for days before it's fit to be used again. 
but it would be better for no one to be here when the temple is broken into. That was surely an understatement. When they landed in the beginning light of dawn, the man went off with Ree's servants without saying a thing more. But then Karun was so tired, he probably couldn't have asked his questions coherently anyway. So for the third night, he fell asleep in the curve of Avatra's belly, more exhausted than he would ever have thought possible. For the third afternoon, he woke in a rush, this time out of a confused dream of flying fire and death. He lay there for a moment while his heart pounded with anxiety and forced it to calm. After all, it was only a dream, and it was a dream of things he'd gone through many times before this and would do so many times in the future. He wasn't a winged one, to have dreams of portent. In fact, right now, he was altogether glad that was the case. It would have been much too heavy a burden to carry. And this time, there was someone from among the rescued of last night waiting for him when he gathered all of them for their meeting. A lady with more of the air of a queen about her than no fret. Someone Akaten clearly knew very well. Wing Leader Karan, I make you known to Winged One May Anejat, she said with utmost formality. She is the High Priestess of all the Winged Ones of Alta. Karan bowed about as much as he did to Lord Kamun. The lady lifted a sardonic brow, but gave him a smile of approval. Not afraid, I see. He shrugged. Fear of you would serve no purpose, and we need to keep our wits about us. How many winged ones are left to be rescued? No more than a handful, the high priestess said. You'll have them out on your first trip. The rest are all servants and... She hesitated then said, Servants and friends, but I came to tell you that the mage I suspect something. I am far-sighted, and I have been bending my will to see what I may see this day. They've brought their private guards there now, and it looks as if they're planning to break down the doors. Before Karan could say anything, Asitra laughed, although it did not sound as if what he was about to say was something he considered humorous. Much good it may do them. My last man said you people have moved everything movable and packed the antechamber behind every door solid. They can break the doors, but they won't get in until they clear the place. The woman nodded. But our time is short, she told them all. That is what I came to say, and to thank you, and to tell you that I know that not only will you and your dragons do their best, I also know that no one anywhere would put as much of themselves into this as you have. She bowed deeply to all of them, then turned and left the training ground without a backward glance. Uras broke the silence, laughing shakily. <laughs> I feel as if I have just had Lady Iris appear, pat my head, and tell me I have been a good boy and to finish cleaning my room and run along now, he said, which made them all laugh. The ways of the gods are strange, and the ways of their servants even stranger, Ari said briskly. She's exhausted, Akaten said doubtfully, looking after the woman. I've never seen her so thin and drained looking. So the sooner we finish this thing, the sooner she'll have no people back in that temple to worry about, Karun replied, putting a bit of a whip crack into his words. You heard the winged one? Let's get into the saddle and into the air. Either the Magi will spot us, or they won't. And in either case, this is the last night, and we'll be gone before they can do anything about it. From your mouth to the ear of Horus, Minetka said, earning himself a swat from Asit Ra. Horus helps those who help themselves, Karan reminded them. Into the sky, Jousters! We'll be seeing our own beds again by mid-morning which reminder was enough to put fire into the most tired of them after all. 17. But as they approached the temple this time, it was clear that something was very different. There was a lot of light on the horizon, and a red glow in the sky. It looked like a fire. As they got nearer, what had looked like a building on fire resolved itself into a scene of purposeful activity. Armed men with torches swarmed the grounds, and there were bonfires burning under the walls, the light reflected in the pale stone from bottom to top. Smoke rose into the air in clouds, making his nose itch. No one would be escaping over the walls by ropes tonight. 
His heart sank a little. He could only hope that anyone willing to get out that way had last night. How many were left? No one had given him a number. Maybe no one could. Or maybe no one was going to, to spare him knowing it was not going to be possible to get them all out before daylight. They dared not fly by day, or those on the ground would see where they went, leading the magi straight to Aunt Ree. The dragons didn't like the smoke and the fires, but they were bred for cavorting in and around sulfur springs. The smoke was going to bother their riders a lot more than it would trouble them. It was a still night, and the smoke rose into the air and hung there like low clouds. Though it made his eyes burn, it might not be a bad thing. They might be able to use it to hide behind. There was one thing. The extra light would make it easier for the dragons to see where they were going. He kept Avatra high as they came in behind Akhet Ten, forming the square well into those clouds of smoke. He glanced behind to see if the next rider caught the hint and was gratified to see that the others were following his lead. At least there will be more light to land by. Riethka descended into the smoke to the square defined by torches on the roof of the temple. There were a lot of torches up there now, more than there had been last night, more than enough for all those men on the ground to notice. Well, it's not as if it's going to make any difference. Incredibly, no one on the ground saw the dragon landing on the roof, but then Riethka was a flickering shadow in the smoke indigo with a confusing touch of silver. When she rose again with her double burden, she was still barely visible among the shifting shadows in the smoke, and there was no outcry. Not so for Avatra. As she fanned her wings to land, he heard the cries from below and ducked instinctively as arrows whistled through the night sky. As his helpers handed his next passenger up behind him and tied them together with rope, he saw that they all had improvised wicker shields strapped to their backs. A moment later, he understood why, as a clatter of spent arrows bounced off the shields or the rooftop. One or two had a little more energy and stuck in the shields. His young female passenger shook with fear, no older than Akhet Ten, surely, and just as surely had never personally seen a shot fired in anger, much less had one directed at her. Those who helped tie her in place were made of sterner stuff. Clever story they're putting out about you, said one of those men he'd thought he'd recognized last night. Evidently your teens come to steal us away. Really? He gave the rope a good hard tug to test it, and coughed as he breathed in a little too much smoke. <laughs> I don't suppose they've got an explanation as to why you're tying yourselves onto our dragons. Not yet, came the reply, and a sardonic sneer. But I expect they'll think of something soon. They're shooting to kill us, you know. I've overheard the Captain of Tens giving the orders. We're better off dead than in your hands, according to him. A muffled wail behind his back made it very clear what his passenger thought of all this. Then we'll just have to be where the arrows aren't, he said, keeping his tone confident. The helpers stepped away, and he sent Avatra up. His passenger alternated distraught sobs with coughs the entire way back. He tried to get some answers out of her but she replied with nothing but weeping. He tried not to be too irritated with her, but it was difficult. He desperately wanted to know how many people were left in that temple, and she was about as sensible as a terrified hare, and just as articulate. As he approached the temple the second time, he saw that there were archers not only on the ground, but on the roofs of nearby buildings, trying to keep up a steady barrage of arrows. Most fell short, but there were enough that were reaching the roof of the temple that he felt a thrill of alarm. But when he landed this time, instead of a clattering of falling shafts, or worse, the sound of arrows striking nearby, there was nothing, and he wondered why. Wondered, until he heard the swish of arrows through the air again, and a thudding. But it was a thudding sound that was far off to the right, literally as far away as it was possible to get, and still be on the rooftop. He looked to that side, and to his utter astonishment, saw a roll of straw matting standing on the edge of the roof, bristling with arrows, with more thudding into it with each moment. Magic, said one of the helpers, following his glance. Your current passenger's idea. He patted the middle-aged woman's plump arm, and she smiled wanly. Seems she's been dabbling in magus work. Learned it from some Acadian friend of hers. Now that straw roll somehow sucks all the arrows toward it. Damned useful. 
but now it's time for you to get her out of here. Avatra launched herself skyward before he could reply. She didn't want to be on that roof any more than he did. His passenger looked down at the besiegers as they passed overhead and shivered. It's a very difficult thing, seeing all those people and knowing they want to kill you, she said forlornly as they passed into darker, cleaner air out over the canal. It's what every soldier sees when he looks at the enemy, he offered, hoping to make her feel a little better, or at least less vulnerable. You're right, of course, she said, but it's still a hard thing. No one ever wanted to kill me before. He thought about how cherished, how respected, admired, even loved the winged ones had been, and felt a certain sympathy for her distress. You've been very sheltered, he said reluctantly. She said nothing for a while. Then, too sheltered, she replied, sounding a little less sorry for herself. If we had been paying attention instead of isolating ourselves in our own little world, we would have noticed that rot beginning. What's happening now is partly our own fault. There were signs. When the Magi singled out certain nestlings for extra training that somehow made them lose their powers, or sent them on errands during which there were... accidents. But when the Magi proposed making the storms stronger, it seemed like such a good idea at the time. It might go back further than that, he pointed out as Avatra sneezed, then pumped her wings to get a little more height. Back to when they first made the eye. Oh, yes. The eye. He felt her shiver. How could we ever have thought that was a good idea? It's not like building walls. Walls can't be turned against your own people. We should have known then that they were on no one's side but their own. Yes, you should have, he thought. For people who were supposedly far-sighted, you certainly kept looking in the wrong places. His passenger didn't know how many people were left in the temple, but when he returned for another trip, he saw something going on below that made him think they had even less time than he'd assumed. The besiegers were building piles of wood against the doors, and he thought about what the man on the roof had said. Better dead than in your hands. The doors were wood, not stone. Set fires against them and the doors would burn through, the fire moving into the building through all that closely packed furniture and debris. How long would the fires burn before they reached the roof? The rooms below were crammed full of all manner of flammable furnishings to prevent the besiegers from breaking in once the doors were broken down. Fire would block the exits as soon as the doors burned through. There would be no escape that way. There was a crowd gathering on the edge of the temple grounds, watching. Would they do anything if they saw the Magi's men were going to burn out the winged ones? Or were they, by this point, too afraid? Had the use of the eye destroyed any spirit of rebellion that still lay within them? He was rather afraid that it had. He landed and took aboard his first physically injured passenger, a middle-aged man with a heavily bandaged head who seemed dizzy and partly disoriented. When he saw what they were doing down there, he went to the edge of the roof and tried to reason with them, said the man Karun thought had once been a winged one, and whose name he still didn't know. Somebody got him with a stone from a sling. Don't let him fall asleep. No fear of that, Karun replied as the man climbed up behind him clumsily. It's not exactly a smooth ride. They're coming, called someone who was watching at the edge of the roof under cover of an improvised shield. Get out of here, the man barked at Karun, slapping on Avatra's shoulder, startling her into rearing away from him, then leaping skyward before he could ask who or what was coming. Not that it mattered. He saw what it was as soon as Avatra cleared the roof. They were more of the Magi's men, and they were firing the wood stacked up against the doors of the temple. Time had just run out. He wanted to turn back and take on another passenger, but Avatra was not having any of that idea, and at any rate, she was burdened with as much as she could bear right now. So Karun and his passenger flapped off into the darkness, both of them looking over their shoulders in white-lipped silence, until the temple with its rising fires was out of sight. In fact, it was a rougher ride than before, as Avatar dodged and snapped at arrows as she rose and continued to fly evasively, 
Even when there were no missiles speeding toward them, his passenger hung on grimly, arms wrapped around Karan's chest, sucking in his breath in pain whenever Avatra jolted sideways. Despite his orders to everyone else, he urged Avatra to greater speed. This was only the fourth trip. How many more would they be able to manage before fire consumed the temple? One? Two at most? There was no point in saving her strength now. Mercifully, his passenger was silent except for the occasional whimper of pain. Karun wondered what he had been to the winged ones, since he was not wearing their emblem, but evidently felt enough authority to try to reason with the Magi's men. Was he the overseer of the temple servants? Merely someone of rank caught in the temple when the siege started? The flight took far, far longer than he wanted it to, even though Avatra had caught his urgency and was flying faster than she'd ever dared do in darkness before. He landed Avatra hard and hurried to untie himself from his passenger, but because of the man's head injury, the helpers had tied him on far more securely than the last, and the knots resisted his clawing fingers. Orest landed while he was still trying to get the ropes undone, and then with the edges of his passenger's cloak still smoldering, Ari landed, and behind him in a cluster all the rest, including Aket Ten. And no one had a passenger except Orest and Ari. He felt a sick numbness wash over him as his hands went cold. He caught Ari's eyes as Ari handed down a middle-aged woman who was still coughing, and Ari shook his head. His mind wouldn't encompass it. Surely the fires couldn't have moved that fast. Surely there was time for another round of rescues. But Aket Ten was weeping silently, tears making black tracks through the soot and ash on her face. I don't understand it, Gan said, his voice flat and expressionless. It all burned like everything was soaked in oil. Even the stone was burning. It makes no sense. Some mischief of the Magi, I've no doubt, replied Aunt Ree grimly as two of her servants cut the last man free from Karun and handed him down. Some way to make stone burn like wood, and wood like oil-soaked papyrus. She said nothing more then, only went to Akat Ten, who slid down from Riethka's back and into her aunt's comforting arms. Karun felt cold all over. He thought about the men he'd last seen on that rooftop, about the servants that might have been still waiting just below and wanted to vomit. He glanced up in the direction of the city, and saw an ugly red glare on the horizon. When he looked back down again, one of Ree's servants was handing him a bundle, a water skin and food. What? he began. The high priestess moved out of the shadows like a ghost, startling him. New orders, wing leader, she said gravely. Orders sent through me to you from the mouth of the gods, who is called Caleth. There is no reason to stay, and your presence will bring danger to Rikaron as the Magi seek for your dragons. Come home, he says. We will scatter, and come to sanctuary safe. Karun swallowed down his nausea and looked at the others. Can you all make the flight? he asked. One by one. They nodded as Ree's servants handed them identical bundles to his. Even Aket Ten looked up, face smeared with tears and soot, and nodded. And he felt at that moment a terrible aching need for the desert, for a place that was clean, where people did not put each other to the flame because they could not be controlled, and where other people did not stand by and watch them do so. He had thought the Tians were cruel. What the Magi had turned his own people into was something far worse. People who now were so afraid for themselves that they had lost every vestige of morality. Right, he said harshly. Let's get out of here. And that was what haunted him, the entire flight back. The priestess had called it a rot. If so, it was a rot that killed the conscience and maybe the soul along with it. Those people had watched the Magi drag the winged ones away, day after day, and had done nothing. They had watched the Magi's men lay siege to the temple for weeks, and had done nothing. The mob that had finally gathered to protest had done very little, and had scattered quickly when the eye was used, and it should have been possible to save the winged ones, 
Why had the army not rebelled at their treatment? No point in saying they were under orders either, since when was it right to follow orders you knew were immoral? And tonight, they had watched while the Magi's men prepared to burn the temple to the ground, and had done nothing. And it had all begun long before this. Hadn't they been spending these last moons simply looking the other way while friends and relations were denounced and hauled away? Hadn't many of them been willing to make accusations of their own to prove their loyalty and turn suspicious eyes away from themselves? And why? Because they were too attached to possessions, to the city itself, to flee? Because it was easy to look away when the Magi were only hurting the foreigners, or the nobles, or the people in the next ring that you didn't know, and because when you looked the other way once, it was easy to keep doing so? Or because it was easier to believe the lies that the Magi told? Easier not to think for one's own self? Easier to accept at face value everything that was told to you? It gnawed at him all the way back, and when he and Abitra finally landed in the gray light of dawn, he felt as if he could not sleep until he had cleaned his body of the stench of burning. He went down into the caverns and took a rare bath, scrubbing himself until his skin felt raw to be rid of the smell. He went to find Akhet-Ten, but she was nowhere to be seen. Maybe that was just as well. He wasn't sure he could offer her any kind of comfort, when she had just seen a place where she knew people burning to the ground. When he staggered off to bed, Avatro was already asleep, and as he gazed on her, he felt a moment of envy to see her, so calm and peaceful, with no nightmares to trouble her sleep. They certainly troubled his that night, and for many nights to come. And yet, sooner than he would have thought, things got back to normal, or mostly normal. Perhaps it was because he had not actually seen the temple burning. Only Ari had endured that particular sight. And maybe his experience in fighting had hardened him somewhat to such things. Maybe it was because, once the last of the Winged Ones arrived, there was another shrine made to the memories and spirits of those who had been lost. Maybe it was nothing more than time. Time which was, of certainty, filled. It would have been far worse had Akaten actually witnessed the horror of the burning temple. But the others had turned her back at the halfway point, and all she knew was that it had burned, and those who were left with it. She sought Karun out the night after their return to sanctuary, and spent all of it weeping herself sick in his arms. It was a very long night, perhaps the longest in his life, save only one. He would have spared her that distress if he could have. And yet this was the face of war from which she had been sheltered. Death, and not death in battle, but terrible, useless, needless death, the deaths of those you knew, cared about even loved. War was no longer an abstract to her, and in fact, neither was death. After that, though, he was sure it preyed on her mind as nothing in her life ever had before, not even her own fear. She never said another word about it. She drooped despondently about for a while, and that was worse than if she had wept and raged and railed against the Magi. And he was tempted, oh, how tempted, to weigh his pain against hers, the miserable deaths of father, mother, sisters against the deaths of her friends. But he didn't. You couldn't weigh pain as if it was the feather of truth. He knew that now, something he had not known before Torith's murder. One pain could not weigh another. No pain could balance out another. In the end, all pain stood alone. And that wasn't something he could tell her either. It was something she would have to learn herself. Eventually, she regained her spirits as the winged ones trickled in a few at a time, and she was able to gain some sort of consolation with them. This was one place in her life where Karun felt absolutely helpless to give her exactly the kind of consolation she needed. He didn't know these people. They hadn't been his friends. He could only mourn them in the abstract, and it wasn't as if he didn't already have enough deaths in his own life to mourn. And it wasn't as if their days didn't have plenty to fill them. Not only were the dragonets hatched out in sanctuary growing rapidly and requiring preliminary training, but Corson's family was doing so as well, and he had a whole new problem to deal with. 
Nofret was besotted. It was all anyone could do to get her to tear herself away from the dragonettes every evening, and she was beside herself with impatience to get out to them in the morning. Karun wouldn't have credited it. He would have thought that while she would feel some affection for them, she wouldn't have felt that bond that every other jouster with a hand-raised dragon did. But there was not a shadow of doubt. She was obsessed over those dragonettes just as if she was their own mother. In particular, she was attracted to a gorgeous little creature of thurian purple shading to deep scarlet that she named Theon, the smallest of the lot, but still larger than the smallest dragonette back in Sanctuary, for once again, Corson had thrown an outstanding clutch. And this little female was just as attracted to Nofret as Nofret was to her. Every day she ventured nearer and nearer to her human watcher, always with one eye on her mother, who would snort warningly whenever her offspring drew too near to the human. But every day what Corson considered too near grew less, until one day while Corson was dozing and all of them were worn out from playing, the dragonette waddled over to Nofret, dropped her head in Nofret's lap, and fell immediately asleep. Nofret froze, not daring to touch. Akat Ten and Karun tensed, Karun signaling Avatra to be ready to dive in to the rescue if need be. Corson raised her head, gave Nofret a penetrating look, and dropped her head back down to her own foreclaws, closing her eyes. After that, Corson allowed Nofret to touch, clean, and play with all four babies, and even feed them. In fact, the older and more clamorous the babies got, the more she seemed to welcome the help. Akatin reported that Corson was coming to think of Nofret as another dragon, a very peculiarly shaped, tragically dwarfed, and inadequately scaled dragon, but a dragon nevertheless. Even Ari began to relax when he saw how Corson acted around Nofret. The peculiar thing was, even as Corson acted as if Nofret was a dragon, she continued to make threat postures whenever any other humans ventured too near. Akat Ten couldn't explain it. Nofret is a dragon, and we aren't, not in Corson's mind, was all she could say. Maybe it's because we always dropped food from a height, and Nofret was the first to bring it to her on the ground. Maybe it's because Nofret doesn't look like a jouster. Then if Corson lays again, and we can find her and the clutch, we have to replicate everything we did this time, he said firmly. Akat Ten nodded. There was no change in either the situation in Alta or in Tia, and Karun was content to leave all such weighty matters in the minds and hands of those his senior in experience and wisdom. Often enough, as he lay staring into the dark at night, he thought of the uncertain future and felt, with Orist, that he would rather, far rather, not think of it at all. That he would rather be told what to do. But that was the path that had led here in the first place, people giving over thinking to others, and doing what they were told, believing what they were told to believe, even when it went against their own good sense and all reason. Still, he was glad enough to have something else to occupy his mind, however temporarily. As the days passed, the babies began to exercise their wings, pumping them vigorously and making little hops into the air. Those back at Sanctuary were learning to bear saddle and rider and exercising against weight. Corson's offspring, however, were not to be meddled with. They would be fledging soon. And I have no idea how we're going to get Theon to follow me, Nofret said, as Karun and Avatra flew her out to Corson's nest the morning after the first of the sanctuary dragonettes had made his first flight. I know Corson's getting restless. Are they like cats, where they move their nest periodically? Not as far as I know, he said truthfully. I wish I could tell you more, but all I know is how the hand-raised ones act. Well, I'm afraid she's trying to move the nest, and if the little ones follow her, we might never find them again, she fretted. As they swooped in to land, it looked as if Nofret's fears might be well-founded. Corson was pacing, fanning her wings, then pacing again, peering up at the sky whenever she snapped her wings open. The babies were imitating her, and they usually were not awake at this hour. Akat Ten landed Ryethka beside Avatra on the canyon floor, as Nofret hurried over to Corson and the dragonettes with the first lot of meat. Corson took it. 
then uncharacteristically began to eat it herself, leaving it to Nofret to feed the little ones. Akat Ten watched them with her eyes narrowed and a speculative look on her face. What? Koran demanded. I don't know, she said slowly. There is something very odd going on. She continued to stare. I'm trying to encourage the little ones to stay with no fret of Corson flies. Corson finished her first portion and looked straight at Karun, rather than no fret, and snorted in that old imperious fashion he had come to know. He didn't need Akaten's interpretation to take down another portion of meat and drag it over to her. She seized it and began tearing chunks off it, one eye on him and one on the sky. It took a third and fourth to satisfy her, and not once in all that time did she feed any of her babies, not even when they came to her, nudged her portion, and begged pitiably. After a while, the beggar would go right back to Nofret, who was infinitely more reliable, if rather slow. Then when the fourth helping was a memory, Corson stood up, raised her head, and stared at Nofret for a very long moment, as if measuring her for something. Nofret stopped feeding the dragonettes, feeling the eyes of their mother on her, and turned. She swallowed hard and visibly. Corson had Nofret fixed in an unwinking gaze, and Karun didn't blame Nofret for a sudden surge of unease. He started to loosen his knife in its sheath, but Akat Ten stopped him with a gesture. It's not what you think, she whispered. Just then, Nofret began to slowly back away from the dragonettes. It wasn't the first time that Corson had leveled a challenging stare at her, and always, once Nofret began to move away from them, Corson stopped challenging. Not this time. This time, Corson took the two enormous strides needed to reach Nofret, bent her head down before anyone could react, and shoved Nofret in the gut with her nose, tumbling her back into the midst of the dragonette pack. And then she turned, spread her wings wide, and with a few lumbering steps, threw herself into the air. Within moments, she was a dot in the sky. In another, she was gone. She's gone, Akka Ten said with astonishment. Karun shrugged. Off to hunt, I suppose, he said. This wasn't the first time she'd gone off to do so. The only real difference was that this time she had very graphically put no fret in charge of the babies. No? I mean, she's gone, said Akat Ten. She's gone for good. I felt what she meant in my mind. She left no fret in charge, and now she's gone for good, and she's not coming back. No fret hauled herself to her feet, pulling on dragonette necks and shoulders to get there. She might have been a bit more polite about it, she said indignantly. And then, as Karun stared at her, she blinked. What do you mean she's gone for good and left me in charge? It took a while for the implications of that to sink in, but when they finally did, Karun found himself at a loss for words. Oh, was all he could manage. Ah, how are we going to get them back to Sanctuary? In the end, there was no good way to get them back to Sanctuary. They weren't fledged yet. They couldn't fly on their own. They certainly couldn't walk. You couldn't tie them to a camel. They were too big for even Cachette to carry, and at any rate, no one wanted to terrify them by bundling them into a carry net to be flown back. So the only answer was for no fret to spend the night with them. And perhaps more than one night with them, but he wasn't going to suggest that just now. Ari was not happy about that, but what could he do? They accepted Riyath Ka, and Riyath Ka was willing to curl up with them, though they were wary about Avatra so Akat Ten stayed with her, which Karun was no happier about than Ari was. But in the morning, three of the dragon boys who had not gotten an egg were flown in by himself, Ari, and Gan, to join Nofret in her baby tending. A night without their mother had made them a lot more accepting, and having someone willing to feed them, without having to take turns competing with a sibling, cemented the acceptance of these strangers. They were not shy at all after about mid-morning, and at least that meant that Nofret did not have to spend another night with them. The boys could do that, taking it in turns to play night guard. By the next day, an additional night guard of actual former soldiers from Tia had managed to make the journey over the sands by camel. 
and at that point, there seemed to be no reason why this batch of dragonettes needed to leave. And since no one else seemed inclined to bring it up, Karun did in council. He waxed a great deal more eloquent on the subject than he had expected to be. No reason why some of those strange cliff dwellings couldn't be made habitable either. Granted, no one had mentioned that the abandoned city should be inhabited again right now, but if Sanctuary was going to be the city of priests, then the new city would have to be made ready for everyone else at some point. Why not now? The repairs and improvements could be made gradually, if they began now. Wouldn't it be better to have them underway if an emergency came up? After all, if Sanctuary is attacked, we're going to need some more defensible to send the children to, Karun pointed out as Caleth hit a smile. Ari threw up his hands. You won't rest until you've got your dragon city, will you? He said crossly. All right, have it your way. But when Theon fledges, Nofret is bringing her back here. Theon did fledge shortly thereafter, and Nofret did lead her back to Sanctuary, riding behind Curon, while Theon lumbered clumsily along behind, whining piteously and looking absolutely exhausted when they all came in to land. But the other three dragonettes and their putative riders stayed, and so did the guards. And two, some of the Altans who found the desert too dry, elected to try the new city, and found it to their liking. As more refugees arrived, some stayed at Sanctuary, but some moved on to Dragon Court, as the new city was dubbed. Finding that Sanctuary was just a little too full of winged ones and priests and priestly magic to be altogether comfortable for ordinary mortals. When all of the new dragons were fledged, all except Theon, moved to Dragon Court for their initial training. There was more room there, for one thing, and Bakken was perfectly capable of taking them up to the point where they needed to form wings. And at that point, Kalen and Peatep moved there as well, wing leaders of the new black and yellow wings, to take over the training from Bakken. Karan actually felt a little relief at that. There was something about having all of the dragons quartered in one place that made him nervous. Having them divided like this meant a greater margin of safety for them all. They met for joint training in the air over the desert, halfway between the two strongholds. Day by day, the dragonettes grew in their size and strength and coordination. Day by day, the older dragons grew in skill. There were new maneuvers to learn. Now that they no longer needed to evade other jousters, their strategy must be directed against men on the ground. And as they were few and vulnerable, they must choose their targets carefully. And that was how matters stood the day that another messenger came from Alta, bloody and battered, with word that the Magi had finally stepped over the boundary of sanity. They had decided that yet another group required being brought to heal. This time it was the healers that they had put under siege. 18. And the people are doing what? Caleth demanded of the messenger, who shrugged wearily. The people are doing nothing. The healers have been trying to foment discontent ever since the burning of the temple, he replied. The magi finally took notice. They say, he paused, and his brow wrinkled in exhausted thought. They say that the healers hear much, and a great deal of truth, from those who are in pain or otherwise vulnerable. They say the healers must speak for the good of Alter. They demand that the healers are to turn over to them any who have spoken against the Magi, and also those who heal by touch rather than by herb or knife. All those who heal by touch, Nofret's lip lifted. It seems they have decided to drain even Alta's most precious resource to serve their own needs. And they demand that the sanctity of a healer's silence be broken. Merritt was absolutely white-lipped with anger. Odd. Karun would have thought that it would be Heclatus who would be furious, but the Akkadian only looked sad and resigned. It is said, the messenger began, then stopped. It is said what? Ari demanded sharply. It is said that the Magi are looking older, older than they are than years, though who knows what their true ages are, he shrugged. I have not seen them so I cannot be sure. 
Ari looked to Lord Kamun. How goes the war? My spies tell me that it has stalled on the edge of the marshlands, Lord Kamun replied. The Tians are reluctant to go into the true marshlands, and the Altans are reluctant to come out of them. So the Magi are not battening on the deaths that they had hoped for. Ari looked to the messenger and then to Caleth. Mouth of the gods, I think it begins. There was silence, and Caleth bowed his head. Karun held his breath. It begins, Caleth said from behind the curtain of his hair. And only the gods know how it will end. I have seen the beginning. I cannot thread my way through the maze that will follow this bad beginning. Ari nodded, as if he had expected exactly this answer. Then it is for mortals to decide. And one thing I do know, we cannot let the healers stand alone. Agreed? Aclatus' eyes lit, as if he had not expected that answer. Caleth, however, raised his head again and regarded Ari with a wry smile, as if he had. Time was not on their side. They needed to act quickly, and the means of getting messages to the healers were very limited. There was, in fact, only one sure way, and reluctant as he was to use it, at least the time of year was in their favor. The rains had just begun, and the Magi would not be able to use the eye even during daylight hours if there was no sun. Which was a good thing, since the way to get a message to the healers was to drop it on them from the sky. While the best time to drop a message was at night, it could not be too late at night, or it might be lost. Furthermore, with the Magi now aware that there were dragons and jousters still in the world, and acting as the heart of the rebellion, they would be watching the skies. There was a great deal of sky between Sanctuary and Alta, and of all the dragons that were capable of such a journey, there were really only two of colors that would blend in with the storm clouds. Bethlen was one, and Karun had no issues with Minetka taking the task. But the other was Rieth Ka, and Akat Ten's reaction when she discovered that Karun had assigned Minet Ka without even considering her was emphatic. In fact, she stormed into Avatra's pen as if she was taking a citadel, and with nearly as much noise. I can't believe you simply assumed Minette Carr was the only person fit to take this job without even considering me, she shouted, as she shoved her way past her brother, who was lingering in the doorway, listening, while Karan went over the plan with Minette Carr. You must be insane. I'm the smallest jouster. I'll be less of a burden to my dragon. Minette Carr is not much larger than you. Bethlen is bigger than Rieth Carr, and both of them have more experience flying in the rain than Rieth Carr does. Karan countered, as she stood there with her fists on her hips, glaring. Not as much in storms, she shouted back. He won't be flying in a storm, Karan replied, and Bethlen is steadier in bad weather than Rieth Carr. Who says? she demanded furiously. I say, and I'm the wing leader, he replied, his own anger rising to meet hers halfway. Oh, fine. Use that as an argument. She crossed her arms over her chest and glared at him. Abandon logic altogether and fall back on I'm the wing leader. Never mind that I have more communication with my dragon than he with his, or that I have more experience flying high and in storms and long distances, or that I'm lighter, or that silver and blue-black blends into clouds better than indigo and purple. Ignore all that. Ignore the fact that if you're going to do something risky, it's better to have two people doing it to double your chances of getting through. And completely forget about the fact that it looks as if you're cosseting me because I'm a girl. There were tears in her voice when she said that last, and he couldn't meet her accusing gaze because he was trying to protect her. And it was entirely true that the only reason he had dismissed the idea of her going was because she was who and what she was, his beloved, and yes, a girl. How can I expect to deserve equal treatment if you won't give me equal responsibility? She asked tearfully, when he still wouldn't look at her. She has a point, Karun, Orst said, not at all helpfully. He clenched his jaw so hard it hurt. He wanted to tell Orist to mind his own business, but that would mean he would have to pull wing leader rank again, and that ploy was growing weaker by the moment.
Don't you think you ought to give her the chance? Orest continued, even less helpfully. It's only fair. He glared at Orest and decided to bring up family instead. Lord Yatiran wouldn't thank me for putting her in danger. Neither would Lady Iris Aten. He hoped invoking both parents would get Akat Ten to reconsider. Unfortunately, she was made of sterner stuff than he'd thought. I'll get his consent, she said, clenching her own jaw. When he gives his consent to anything, Mother simply steps aside and lets it happen. If I get his consent, will you assign this to me? Dear gods, but at least Lord Yatirin won't be able to put the blame on me for sending his daughter into danger. He'll know it was all her own idea. And Lord Commands, he replied, transferring his glare to her. She traded him glare for glare. And Lord Commands, she agreed. She sounded confident. He only hoped that confidence would be shattered. If both of them give their consent, then you can go, he said, sure that even if she could convince her father, Lord Kamun would never agree. Lord Kamun agreed. So did Lord Yatirin, although he was not at all happy about it, which left Karun without any reason to forbid her. He even went to Hecladis to beg something that would make her feel too ill to fly. The healer stared at him as if he thought Karun had gone mad, and simply answered, Are you daft? It would be worth my life, because you know she'd know I'd done it. No. Absolutely, positively no. And Caleth was no help either. He simply shrugged, opined that no one could hope to stop Akaten from doing anything she really wanted to do, and repeated that he could not see past the Magi interference, not into the city, and not into the future. So, despite his misgivings, despite the nebulous feeling of dread in the bottom of his stomach, there was nothing Karan could say or do, reasonably, to keep her from going. All he could do was to make her swear to be cautious. She and Manetka were going to drop sandbags with messages in them into the inner courts of the healers, messages detailing what the jousters already knew, and advising them that when there was a huge distraction, the healers should escape by whatever means they could. The distraction was already well in hand. Heclatus knew the formulation of some vile concoction called Acadian fire, a substance that stuck to anything it splashed on and burned and couldn't be put out with water. He was making pots of the evil stuff. They would all come in with a load of pots and a brazier apiece, drop in coals and drop the pots. Half of them would unload their burdens on the men besieging the healers, but the other half would unload over the Tower of Wisdom, the Magi's stronghold. When they found their home burning down around their ears, Karan doubted very much that any of them would think about the healers. That was the hope, anyway. As for the besiegers, this Acadian fire stuck to flesh as well as wood and stone, and the higher the jousters were, the more it would splash about when it hit. A nasty trick, but anyone who had stood by while the Temple of the Twins and those left inside it burned deserved whatever he got to Karun's way of thinking. The healers likely would not agree, but that was why Lord Kaman wasn't going to tell them what the distraction was going to be. Well, some of the healers wouldn't agree. Aclatus, after all, was a healer, and he was the one who would be making up those fire pots. Don't take any risks, he told Manetka and Akat Ten for the hundredth time. Don't let yourselves be seen. Just drop your messages and get out of there. The best revenge we can have is to get the healers out underneath their noses like we got ourselves and the winged ones out. They both nodded, Manetka earnestly, Akat Ten with impatience and rebellion in her eyes. He saw it, and it made him sick with dread. But what could he do? He had given his word, and she already resented that she'd been forced to prove she had the right to a place among the jousters and an equal share in the danger they all faced. All he could do was to urge the utmost caution. This is probably even part of an elaborate trap, he went on, knowing he was grasping at straws, but hoping against hope that something would get through to her. You know how the Magi hated the Joustas, and that was before we pulled the winged ones out under their noses. Now they must really loathe us, and they would probably do anything to capture any of us. 
Unfortunately, Manetka chose to take this as evidence that Karun was letting his concerns and fears get the better of him. <laughs> I doubt it's gone that far, the jouster said with a weak laugh. Oh, I'm sure you're right about the Magi hating us, but they have no reason to think we would come to the rescue of the healers. Karun didn't agree with that in the least, but there was no point in arguing. Just remember what they did to the winged ones, he repeated, and stepped back. Akat Ten was only waiting for that, it seemed, because she was in the air and flying toward Alta the moment he was clear of Riethka's wings. Manetka gave him a sympathetic look, and then sent Bethlen into the sky after her, and all he could do was to watch after them. She feels as if she has to do this, Karun, said Nofret quietly in his ear. She feels guilty that she didn't manage to save all of the winged ones. She thinks if she'd just been brave enough, or fast enough, or... Something, the gods only know what. She'd have been able to get them all out. We can't argue with that sort of guilt. It doesn't answer to logic. Well, if she wants me to treat her as if she's a logical person, she ought to behave like one, he replied, irritation momentarily overcoming his feeling of sick dread. Nofret gave him a crooked smile and patted his arm. This is logical, she pointed out. No one is going to take her seriously if she doesn't do everything one of the boys is doing. And what, after all, could he say? The far-sighted priestesses saw nothing. Well, they actually could not see anything anyway, for the Magi had now effectively blocked their ability to see inside the seventh ring, but they had no intuitions of anything going wrong. Caleth saw nothing, and the gods had not spoken through him to warn them. By all logic, he was overreacting being overprotective of Akhet Ten. And yet, he was certain, so completely certain down deep in his soul that this was going to end in disaster, that he avoided everyone else for the rest of the evening, and all but hid in Avatra's pen. She seemed to be just as uneasy as he was, but that could just be because she's picking up my unhappiness, he reminded himself, and tried to soothe her even if he could not himself be soothed and he resolved not to sleep. They were supposed to return before dawn, and he was going to be awake. Despite his best efforts, he dozed off, sitting in Avatra's sand, some time after the middle of the night, and it was a cry of wordless anguish coming from above that woke him. It woke him out of nightmare into nightmare, and he knew. He knew without being told what that haunting cry on the wind meant. The nameless dread he had been laboring under turned to the certainty of disaster, and as he struggled to clear the fog of sleep from his eyes and stagger upright, he felt not an anguish matching the wails now coming from the landing field, but a kind of numbness. It was as if someone had just cut off his arm, and he hadn't yet felt it. It was going to hurt. He knew it was going to hurt. But at the moment... He could only stare at the bleeding stump in a mingling of despair and disbelief, except that instead of a bleeding stump of a limb, he knew it was Akhet Ten who had been amputated out of his life. He knew when he felt what had happened, it would be worse than any physical wound. With leaden feet, he forced himself to go to Bethlen's pen. There they were all gathered all those who were still awake and eager to hear how the message drop had gone. And he did not say a word, could not manage a single syllable, as he listened to Manetka stammer out the tale, while someone else unsaddled Bethlen. Both of them looked terrible. Manetka must have pushed Bethlen to new speeds to get here as quickly as he had. There was a fog, he said, exhaustion dulling his eyes and blurring his voice as he leaned heavily against the wall. We hadn't expected fog. We couldn't tell where we were, except that we could see a ring of torches and bonfires, and I figured that was where the soldiers that the Magi had set to watch had put up a line of guards. I thought we should just drop our messages in the center of all that and hope that some of them landed in courtyards instead of on the roof. But she wouldn't hear of it, and before I could say or do anything... She took Riethka down, and that was when the fog just cleared away. It practically melted out of sight. She wasn't more than halfway down when it was all gone, and by then, 
It was too late to pull up. It was magic then, Gan managed, his eyes gone round and horrified. A trap, said Ari flatly, and closed his eyes. Curse it all. Kuron was right. At least half of this business with going after the healers was a trap meant to take Joustus. They set a trap for you, Manetka. They knew we'd send Joustus if they did to another group what they'd done to the Winged Ones, at least a scout, and they set it all up as a trap and used the healers as bait. I was right, he thought dully, with no sense of triumph. He had never wished to have been wrong more. They used war javelins and throwing sticks. They didn't use bows and arrows, Manetka said, trying to control the quaver in his voice. And they weren't wasting time trying to hit the rider or me. They aimed for Rieth Kerr. They hit her, Orest gulped, and Karun choked back a sob. Manetka nodded miserably. I couldn't see how many hit or where. Enough, anyway, that she just... just crumpled her wings and fell out of the sky. They were both screaming and screaming. It was horrible, hearing them scream like that. He could see it. In his mind's eye, he could see it. The javelins filling the air, the dragon folding up in pain. He could almost hear Akat Ten's scream of fear and anguish. She hit the ground with Akat Ten still in the saddle, and she absorbed most of the impact, Manetka continued, unconsciously pulling at his own hair with his right hand. But I knew she hadn't been that high, just skimming the rooftops. I pulled Bethlen around and saw Arquette Ten moving, and I tried to get down to her. What? After all that, he expected to hear that she'd broken her neck in the fall. She was alive, but she was also a winged one. He felt himself shuddering. By now she might be wishing she'd died in the fall. You mean Arquette Ten's alive? Gan shouted incredulously. She's all right! We can go back. We can rescue her. But Manetka shook his head bleakly and voiced the same thoughts that were running through Karan's head. The soldiers were just all over her before I could even get Bethlen's head around. They've got her gun. The Magi have her. And you know what they almost did to her before. The soldiers spotted me and started shooting, and I couldn't hold Bethlen. She was scared. Scared by seeing Riethka drop out of the sky and hearing both Riethka and Arket Ten screaming, scared of the arrows. I couldn't hold her. Karun heard the emotion, the thought behind the words. I failed her. I should tell him it's not his fault. But he couldn't. He couldn't bring himself to tell Manetka what he himself did not feel. It was Manetka's fault and his. He should have trusted the presentiment of disaster. Manetka should have kept her from going down into the fog, should have insisted on turning back the moment they saw the fog. Manetka looked up, past the others, and saw him. The others followed Manetka's gaze, and an echoing silence fell. One of those silences in which, no matter how it is broken, it just sounds wrong. He stared at them, stared at their stricken expressions, at the guilt in Manetka's eyes, at the pain in Ari's face. Stared, and finally, because there was nothing he could say to any of them that would not simply have brought more pain, he turned away. He stumbled blindly back to Avatra's pen, falling into the walls and bruising his shoulders, as his eyes burned, and he held back his tears by main force of will. He couldn't weep until he got some privacy. But once he was back in Avatra's pen, he threw himself down onto the sand next to her and howled his grief to the stars. They left him alone. Not even Heclatus came near him, and that suited him just fine, because he didn't want their pain. He wanted only his own. He didn't want their apologies. He wanted to nurse his anger against everyone who hadn't listened to him and had encouraged her in this madness. But even the anger wasn't enough to overcome his own guilt or his anguish and he wept into Avatra's neck until he had no more tears to weep. He pillowed his face against her cheek, moaning like a dying animal under his breath, 
clinging to Avatra's neck as the only place of safety in the world, as the sun rose and burned its way across the heavens and sank again. Someone brought Avatra food. He wasn't sure who. They had to bring the meat right into her sandpit, for she wouldn't come out to them. In fact, Avatra refused to leave him, even long enough to eat. So long as he was clinging to her neck, she showed no signs of budging. So whoever fed her brought her food to her, and she ate it with one eye on Karun, her tail coiled protectively around him. Which was how Caliph found him, at some point before sunset. He heard the footsteps and looked up dully. What? he asked, not really caring to hear the answer, and hoping that Caliph would respond to the rudeness by going away. But Caliph didn't go away. Instead, he squatted down in the sand next to both of them. Don't give up. She's alive, and she's not even hurt, he said. We've been able to see that much. They're saving her for something. They've killed her dragon, Karan interrupted harshly. They shot Riethka right out from under her. They don't have to do anything to her to destroy her now. Don't you understand that? Caleth sat back on his heels and watched him measuringly. We aren't even seeing a fraction of what is going on, he replied, with an urgency that penetrated even Karun's grief. Listen to me. They won't hurt her, not right now. They're keeping her for some purpose, and that gives us a chance. We can get her away. She's tough. She knows we won't give up on her and she knows we'll do anything we can think of to rescue her. She'll stay strong as long as there's any chance at all. And we will find a way. His heart leaped, and he seized Caleb's shoulders and shook him. You've seen it? He gasped, hope making him choke on his own words. You've seen us rescuing her? And his heart plummeted again as Caleb shook his head. Nothing so sure. Nothing so definite he admitted, but... Then stop toying with me! He shoved Caleth away. Don't give me hope and snatch it away again. Now listen to me, damn you! Caleth burst out, grabbing his shoulders and forcing him to look into Caleth's eyes. In all of the futures I've seen that end in sanctuary prospering, Akaten is there. He gave Karun a little shake. Why would I lie to you? That was why I wasn't concerned, why I thought, since she felt so resentful about being protected, I should just encourage you to let her do this thing. He shook Karun again hard, twice. I cannot see the way to those futures, but I have seen it. And I know that once we have all the facts, what is happening will make sense, and we will find a way to rescue her. He looked into those deep, black eyes could not look away, and found his heart rising again, just a little. Caleth believed this. Caleth had not been wrong yet. Be patient, Caleth said, with a bit less force. I don't know how this will be, but the only futures I have seen that do not have her in them are futures we do not wish to live in anyway. He closed his eyes for a moment and tried not to think of the other implications of that statement. That the fact that Akaten had been taken meant that losing her had doomed them all. Wait, said Caleth. Hold to hope. That is all I can tell you right now. He stood up, and although Karun would have done the same under ordinary circumstances, all he could do was to sag back against Avatra's shoulder and stare. You ask a great deal, he managed, and you promise very little. That is so I do not play you false, said Caliph somberly. Now, I go to consult with the Tian priestesses, the Thet priests, the winged ones, and Heclatus. And shortly, what we know, you will know. With that, he turned and left Avatra's pen. Avatra blew into his hair and whined. He looked up at her numbly and realized that she must be hungry. Whoever had brought her meat, 
It had only been for the morning meal. The fact that she had put off her hunger while he needed comfort almost made him burst into tears again. But weeping wouldn't get her fed, and she had been patient long enough. He got to his feet and headed for the cold room and some of the stored meat that was there. If he did not yet have hope, he would try not to sink into despair. Not yet, anyway. After all, even if there was nothing else for him, there was always revenge. 19. Somehow he stumbled through taking care of Avatra. Peyotep tried to get him to eat and drink something. He managed the drink, but his throat closed when he tried to swallow food, and he ended up giving it to one of the dragon boys. After Kalith and Peyotep left him, he sank back into leaden despair. Easy enough to say, hold to hope, but there didn't seem to be any hope to hold on to. If anything, knowing that Akaten was probably alive made it all worse. He kept thinking of the bleak despair in that former winged one's eyes, and wondering how long it would take before the Magi burned her out. Or, with Rieth Ke gone, would she even care anymore? He remembered only too sharply how, faced with losing Avatra, he had intended to die rather than lose her. Akaten had been immeasurably closer to Rieth Ke than that. He couldn't even begin to imagine how she must be feeling now. He curled himself up against Avatra's warm side as she crooned over him with anxiety. He closed his sore eyes, mostly because they hurt, rather than with any expectation of falling asleep. I'll just rest here for a moment, he thought, insofar as he could still think at all. And then, the next thing he knew, Huras was shaking him awake, and it was black night. What? he said confusedly. Kaileth wants you, the big fellow announced. No! He got awkwardly to his feet, stiff and sore from sleeping in such a tortured position. What is it? he asked, still sleep-fogged. Huras shook his head. I don't know he confessed. But messengers came in not long ago, and then half the tea and priests came running over. I think something really unexpected and big has happened. I'm supposed to get the others. He helped Karun to his feet, and then disappeared, leaving Karun to make his own way. He got to the audience chamber, the place was lit, and Kalith, Lord Kamun, and Ari were all bent over a map that was spread out on the floor of the chamber because it was too big for a table. So, they're coming here and here, Kalith was saying, tapping the end of a long stick on some place on the map. Kalith looked up at Karun's entrance. Good, you're here. Now we have all the pieces. Everything just erupted. There was no warning. All at once, we're looking at a full-scale invasion of Alta. The war we've had up until now is nothing to the war we're about to see. The Tian army is on the move, said Ari studying the map with a frown in his face. They're actually invading Alton lands right this moment. They've crossed the last border, and they're into the Delta. And I think I know what the Magi are saving Akat Ten for, Caliph said bluntly, looking up at him as he winced. Look here, what season is this? Rains, Karan replied, wondering why that should be relevant, except that the season of rains was a miserable time to be invading the Delta. Normally, the Tian army remained on simple border guard during this season. If they were invading now, they must have a compelling reason to think they needed to. Or, perhaps the advisors believed there was a compelling reason to mount their invasion in the face of constant rain and rising waters. And the Magi can't use the eye when it's dark or there's cloud cover, Kalith said, his mouth set in a grim line. The Magi now posing as advisors of the great king of Tian know that. They were waiting for the rains. They must have been. Karan nodded, interest fading fast. What did he care what the Tian Magi did or did not decide to do? What could this invasion possibly matter? How could it change anything? It looks like real war between the two sets of Magi, Kalith told him. I don't know what happened that the ones with the Tians got exiled from Alta but it looks as if it isn't just that they're battening on the war dead that keeps them there, and it certainly doesn't look as if they're cooperating with the Alton Magi. They seem to want it all, and they've now got the army to get it for them. 
But if the Magi are really fighting each other, could this be the key to getting Akat Ten free? We forgot one thing, said Ari, as Karun nodded. And so did the Tian Magi. The Magi have been, and are, weather workers. Karun shook his head. Which means what, exactly? They haven't the power anymore to send a storm down on the Tian forces. No, Caleth agreed grimly. But if they use Arkat Ten, they have the power to clear the storm over Alta City. At least, for a little while. He blinked, and suddenly it all made sense. The Tians were waiting for the rains to invade, he exclaimed. But the Altans were waiting for them to invade, and get as far as where the eye could reach before clearing the storm. It all made perfect sense. Horrible, perfect sense. Once the Alton Magi knew that their exiles had attained positions of power in Tia, they must have known that would happen, that their exiles would challenge them. But the Altons had the advantage. They knew what the exiles knew, so they could predict what the exiles would do. Caleth nodded. I told you it would all become clear when we put the pieces together. They planned this all along. As soon as they knew the Magi that had been ousted had gotten established in Tia, they knew the Tian Magi would know the Eye didn't work without Sun, and that the rains would be the only safe time to invade. He shook his head. The exiles are playing right into their hands. It wouldn't surprise me to learn that they've pulled back some of the Alton army to tempt them. Certainly by the time we found out about this and went to look, the Altons had already fallen back to here, and here. Karun nodded. It made altogether too much sense to him, too. Look here, Lord Kaman pointed to where squares of stone were playing the part of the Tian forces on the map. This is what Gan and Huras reported to me when I sent them to scout, and the Tians are definitely being funneled. But how does this have anything to do with Arkit Ten? He demanded desperately. How can this possibly connect to her? It's the timing. Arkat Ten is captured, and then by mid-afternoon, the Tians are making their way across Alton lands, said Lord Kaman. It's too much to be a coincidence, not when a fast courier could have gotten to those in command of the Alton forces by early afternoon, telling them the time has come to start the trap. If the Tians had been waiting for an opportunity to open up, the Magi just gave it to them on a platter. He shook his head, not that he disbelieved them, because it made entirely too much sense. But what would the Magi have done if they hadn't gotten their hands on Arket Ten? They probably planned this a long time ago, Caleth mused aloud. Then they lost the Winged Ones. They must have been frantic, trying to figure out how to get the power they needed to clear the skies and use the eye. Frantic enough to be willing to try draining a healer by touch. Ari said with a nod, and knowing they could lure some of us there by putting the healers under siege is probably why they didn't just lure a few of the healers by touch-out and have their men seize some of them. When they discovered who the jouster was that they had captured, they must have been beside themselves with glee. Karun gritted his teeth. He could well imagine it, especially the couple of magi that had personally given Akit Ten trouble in the past. Or because the healers aren't going anywhere alone anymore, not after some of them have been drained by stealth in the past. They only have to clear the clouds for a little while, Caleth went on. For that, given how strong Akat Ten is, and that she hasn't been drained over and over, well, they probably only need her to give them open skies for as long as they want. They're going to allow the Tian army to close in, then close the jaws of the trap on them and wipe them out with the eye. And then, then they can take Tia at the leisure, Lord Kaman said somberly. Akat Ten is their key. Small wonder they want to use her now, before the Tian Magi know they have her. And the Tian's greed has made them play right into the Alton Magi's hands. We have to get her before... He couldn't finish the sentence. He choked on the words. But, where? Ah. That part I know, Caleth said, much to his relief. The Tian priests came to me with the news of the invasion. Then, when I sent Justice to scout, 
turned their attention back to the Magi of Alta. The T and far-sighted priestesses didn't see much, but one of them did see the single piece of information that was crucial. One of those who sees the future got a brief glimpse of Arket Ten in what I suspect must be the Tower of Wisdom, in a chamber with some mechanism holding an enormous piece of crystal. We believe, the Harris priests and I, that in that future moment they were preparing to clear the sky, then somehow tie her power into the eye. All in an instant, his mind went from grief-clouded and leaden to alert and sharp as a shard of obsidian. Hope. Now he had it. Now he could think again. We'll have to divide the wing, he said, thinking aloud. Five need to go after the Tian forces. I'm sure the Magi calling themselves advisors will be with the army, and we can't risk them getting away. He paused. That should be you, Orests, Minetka, and Gan under Kalin, I think. Get both Minetka and Orest away from the rescue attempt so they don't feel as if they need to kill themselves in the rescue or have the opportunity to try something without thinking first. Good, Ari said, nodding. And the rest, except for you, that is, under Peyatep to run a feint while you go for the actual rescue, I presume? He rubbed his eyes with one hand and felt something inside him falter. I... that's what I want. But it might be better if you were the rescuer, because I'm afraid I might try something stupid. You won't, Ari said flatly. And of the two of us, you are the most likely to be able to get into that tower. Avatra will do anything you ask. I do not have that level of cooperation from Kashet. No, you'll keep your head, and you do the rescue attempt while we run a feint. Let them think we're trying to rescue healers. All right, then. He closed his eyes a moment to think. You're right in thinking our best chance is to rescue her out of the tower. I wouldn't have the faintest idea where they'd be keeping her before then. We'll have to come in above the clouds for the surprise to work in our favor, and it will have to be at night. Cachette would never do that, Ari said firmly. He went in where there was light, but he will refuse to land in the dark. And on the top of the tower? Impossible. Karan nodded. Caliph, have you any idea when this business in the tower is going to happen? Aside from tomorrow, that is. Caliph shook his head regretfully, then brightened. But the priests say this kind of magic takes time, so they'll probably begin as soon as the sun is up. Which means I should be in place that night. He pondered that for a moment. Avatra can't take a full night of cold on the bare top of the tower. And I can't get into the tower from the ground. He thought for a moment more. I need to talk to someone who knows magic. I need to talk to a third priest, said a deep voice from the door. And here is one. One of the tallest and most heavily muscled men Karun had ever seen outside of the army or the jousters stood in the door. Bikara at your service, he said soberly. The high priest tells me you have need of magic. Tell me what you need, and I will tell you if any of us can do this. A way to keep Avatra warm at night at the top of a tower, Karun said instantly. And I need a way to know from above the clouds that the Magi's tower is right below me. Now he had something he could do. These were simple things, and yet so crucial and so impossible to achieve without magic. Bikara pursed his lips, then looked up at the ceiling. Karan waited. He got the impression that the priest was thinking hard and rapidly. Finally, the reward for his patience. I think, Bikara said. We can't do this. As the last light faded, Karun and Avatra circled above the clouds over Alta City. No one could see him from here. The only problem, of course, was that he couldn't see anything, and he needed to wait until darkness fell, while people's eyes were still making the adjustment from light to dark, and a shadow could fall from the clouds and have less chance of being seen. In his hand was a disc made of glass and on that disc was a glowing spot that moved as he moved. When the spot was in the center of the disc, 
it meant he was directly over the tower. So small a thing, and it would not last for long. By midnight, its power would be exhausted. But by midnight, he would be on the tower and would not need it. Without it, he would have to come in beneath the clouds and approach the tower from a distance, drastically increasing the chance of being seen. With it, he could drop down from directly above. The tower, it seemed, sent out magic. The glowing spot was a reflection of that magic. The disk was not, as the use of the far-seeing eye was, an active thing that could be blocked. It was more like a mirror, a passive thing showing only what another magus might see merely by looking in the right way. Magi and those of us priests who also know the ways of magic can see this, Bikara had told him. I merely give you a way to see what I can see. The last of the sun tipped below the clouds, which turned blood red below him. He hoped it wasn't an omen. Avatra continued to circle at his direction, although she was growing uneasy as her frequent glances down showed him. She knew it would be dark soon, and she didn't like to land in the dark any more than any other dragon did. But other than her glances downward, she did nothing. She trusted him. When the last red of sunset had left the sky, and stars had begun to appear in the east, he centered the glowing spot on the disk and sent Avatra plunging down through the clouds. She could not have been more willing. She pulled in her wings and dove, trusting to him to be her eyes. As the drop sent his heart racing and his stomach clenched, there was also a moment of eye-stinging awe that she did trust him so much. It was nothing like the wild plunges he and Akaten had made when they seeded the winds with the plant disease that rendered Tala useless. There didn't seem to be any lightning anywhere around, and if there was wind, it was too little to take note of. What there was a great deal of, however, was rain. Avatra was forced to moderate her fall, spreading her wings and turning the plunge into a tight spiral downward. He was soaked within moments of passing into the clouds, as if someone had emptied an entire bath over him, and the farther they dropped, the worse it got, until, as they broke through the bottom of the clouds, he began to wonder if he was going to find himself swimming to the tower. This was the central island of Alta City, the place where the elite of the elite lived. Here, too, stood the temples to the most important gods, the royal palace, and, of course, the Tower of Wisdom, the tallest building on the island and the symbol of the power of the Magi. Though even in the semi-darkness the damage wrought by eye and earthshake on the rings was obvious, there was no obvious sign of any such damage here on the center island. There were no buildings in ruins, no burned-out places. But Karan didn't have much time to look either. He and Avatar were coming straight down to the top of the tower to avoid being seen, and the faster he got her down, the better. And, of course, Avatra was all but blind in this light, depending on him to tell her what to do in time for her to do it. At the height of a single-storied house above the top of the tower, he signaled her to back wing and start to land. She responded instantly, fanning her wings furiously and tucking her hindquarters under, then stretching out with her back legs as she felt for the surface she trusted would soon be there. This was the moment they were most likely to be seen, or heard, as her wings pumped, creating a kind of thunder. He felt it when a single talon touched that surface. She back-winged a little harder, and he felt her hindquarters stretching. Then as she got her weight onto the surface, he felt her legs take it. She folded her wings and settled onto the tower top with hardly more than a whisper of sound. Karun sagged against her neck for a moment in relief. She'd never done this in the full dark before, and yet she had trusted him trusted him even though they had no more communication than shifting weight, hand signals on her neck, and whispered voice. He told her fervently what a clever dragon she was, then slipped off her back and onto the wet sandstone of the tower. He saw with relief that there was a knee-high parapet running all around the edge, so Avatra would not be immediately visible. Of course, when dawn came, there was the little problem of a scarlet dragon perching on the top of the pale stone of the Tower of Knowledge. Not all of her was going to fit behind that parapet. But first, she needed to be fed. There were two bundles of food for her, in baskets on either side of her flanks. Not butchered meat, 
This was all whole small animals, things she could and would swallow whole. There would be no blood and no mess. He emptied one pannier in front of her, and she gulped down everything while he untied the other and put it aside. He'd feed it to her in the morning before he went inside. He quickly untied the bundle he'd brought from behind the saddle and shook it out as she finished the last of her meal. It was, to all outward signs, a simple huge square of canvas, like one of the awnings that used to keep rain off the pens, or a sail of the sort you'd find on any vessel moving up and down the great Mother River and her daughters. But the moment he shook it out, this expanse of canvas began to radiate the same heat as a flat rock on a pleasant summer day. The same heating spell that kept the sands of the dragon's pens hot kept this piece of fabric just as warm, courtesy of the Thet priests. This was how Avatra would be able to endure the cold and rain of the night. He shook it out over Avatra and made sure that she was entirely covered before climbing in under it with her. His clothing quickly began to steam. This was every bit as hot as the sands. Avatra was already relaxing. It's a pity this is so complicated a bit of magic, he thought, trying to keep his mind on something other than the fact that Akat Ten was somewhere below. Well, perhaps someday, someday when there are more of us, and no magi. The canvas had another use besides keeping Avatra warm all night. It was nearly the same color as the sandstone. If Avatra kept her head down and her tail tucked in, Chances were no one would see her from directly below, and it wasn't likely anyone across the canal would look at the tower long enough to notice a lump on the top of it. At least, no one would see her until he needed her to be seen. And Akaten was somewhere below, hurt, perhaps. Kalith said that she hadn't been hurt, but how could he be sure? Frightened, she was surely frightened, and mourning her dragon, praying that help would somehow come before it was too late. I'm here he thought hard, wondering if she could somehow pick it up. We'll get you out. Just hold on. It was very comfortable under the folds of that cloth. The canvas was waterproof enough that his clothing was drying out. The Thet priests said that the Magi wouldn't sense the magic, even though it was so close to them, because the thing in the tower was so magical already. The sail would be like a lantern lit under the desert sun at noon. You wouldn't see the flame unless you were looking for it and even then you would have to practically be on top of it. How scared is she? How hurt is she? Have they already done anything to her? Was she in a bare, cold cell somewhere down below, chilled, aching, maybe hungry? What had they been doing to her? He didn't really want to think about it. He went over his plan in his mind. Before dawn, he would have to get into place, moving while there was just enough light to see by, but not so much that anyone would be around to spot him, he hoped. There was a lot of hope involved in this, an awful lot of hope. Avatra was already asleep. He could feel her breathing. She was very comfortable under this sail. And with the rain drumming on it, it was like the old days, back when he was just beginning the new wing of dragons, with rain drumming on the canopy that kept the water out of the hot sand. Back when Torith was alive, before Akat Ten became one of them. If they've hurt her, his stomach nodded, and not just with anxiety over Akat Ten. He wished he was doing something other than just waiting. Fear crept slowly over him, chilling his heart. He tried to drive it away by throwing himself into his planning. There wasn't a lot of room inside the tower. He would probably not have to face more than two people, the Magus and whoever he brought to help him. A guard, probably. He would have to get rid of both of them. Be honest, I'm going to have to kill them. This was going to be hard. He'd never killed anyone face to face before, and he might have to. Would have to. Almost a certainty. Actually, he hadn't ever killed anyone, not that he was certain of. In that last fight when the Tala ran out, he and the others had mostly just tried to make the Tian dragons angry, so they'd throw their riders, or at least get the dragons so agitated that they'd fight their jousters, force them to make their beasts go to ground, just so the jouster could get off before the dragon could throw them. He'd wanted people dead, 
but he'd never done the deed with his own hands. He felt very conscious of the long knife at his hip. He was going to have to use that knife. That he tried not to think about. He just drilled himself in what he had to do next when dawn came, dozing off, then waking, to go over it all again. He willed himself to see every step over and over, until as the rain slackened just a little and the first hint of dawn lightened the sky, he shook off the last of his sleepiness and went to work. And it felt like he had done it a hundred times before. First, he unloaded the second pannier in front of Avatra. She wasn't awake enough to be hungry yet, but when she was, her breakfast would be waiting right there for her, and she wouldn't have to move from under her comfortable canvas to eat it. And then she could go right back to sleep again. She probably would. He fastened his rope to Avatra's saddle, pulled on it to make sure it was going to hold. Avatra opened one eye sleepily. Stay, he whispered to her. Hold. Not at all loath to do just that, she closed her eye again and went back to drowsing. He slipped over the parapet at the corner, where the rope wouldn't dangle in front of the window, getting soaked in the process, and walked his way down the wall until he got to a window. He'd been afraid it might be a narrow squeeze, but there was plenty of room, for the windows were enormous, far bigger than he had thought, and there was nothing in the way of shutters or bars on them. Then again, why should there be shutters or bars? Who would be up here? Who would want to break into the stronghold of the Magi? Um, that would be me. He clambered in through the window, flipped the rope out of the way so it wouldn't show if anyone looked out, and waited right in the opening in the darkness. He had to wait for his eyes to adjust, and he wanted to avoid betraying his presence to someone who was paying attention by dripping all over the floor and leaving patches of water there. The room in this tower was half full of something mechanical, and it was not what he had expected. He'd thought vaguely of statues of strange gods, of a room thick with incense, of... Well, now he couldn't put a name to what he'd expected. It stood in the middle of a magic circle of inlaid brass in the middle of the room. He knew it was a magic circle because he had watched the Thet priests lay out something similar when they had made the canvas for Avatra. In chalk on the floor, not in permanent brass inlaid in the floor. But the construction itself looked like one of Heclatus' little mechanical toys, except that it wasn't so very little. The mechanism itself was also made of brass. From the look of things, it could be swiveled and pointed in just about any direction. The heart of the thing was the biggest crystal he had ever seen. Shaped like two pyramids clapped together, an enormous perfect octahedron, he had never seen anything like it. It was flawless, clear, and half again as tall as he was. For a long moment, all he could do was stare at it in wonder. He hadn't known quite what to expect, but whatever it had been, his imagination had not been able to anticipate this. Though why it should be called an eye, he couldn't think. He shook off his amazement and began looking for a place to hide. He might be here a long time. There weren't a lot of hiding places here. He finally found a kind of storage area, a three-sided cupboard in the corner between the windows opposite the place where he had come in. When he pulled the door open, it looked as if it hadn't been opened in years. If there ever had been shelves in there, they were gone now. There were dusty bottles and jars on the floor, some of which inexplicably made his skin crawl. He shoved them aside and squeezed himself in, watching the room through the crack in the door, and it made him wonder. What had this place been used for before it had been made into the home for the eye? The tower was older than the eye. Probably the reason that the cupboard was still here was only because it was too much trouble to pull it out. So far, so good. Back to the hard part. Waiting. 20. There were two possibilities for what would happen next. Either the Magi would bring Akat Ten here before the rest of the wing began their attack, or they would do so because the wing had begun their attack. He thought he was ready in either case. It turned out to be the former rather than the latter. He heard them coming long before he saw them. The hollow tower amplified every little sound from below. A door opening and slamming shut, then footsteps, then voices. A harsh, angry voice. 
Get her under control, curse you! Ow! My lord specified that she is not to be damaged. A second voice, much calmer and deeper than the first. Not being damaged doesn't- Ow! Mean you can't secure her? Ow! Legs! Ow! Seft take you, bitch! But not before I'm- Ow! Karun clutched the side of the cupboard, overcome by mingled elation and rage. Elation because Aket Ten was clearly very much herself, and doing her best to inflict as much damage on her captor as she could. And rage. He wanted to fly down those stairs and slaughter both the men he could hear on the spot. Or the Magus, at least. If my lord would just permit me to knock the girl unconscious. Perfectly calm and matter-of-fact, which only made Karun's blood heat as he clenched his fists. Not just the Magus, then. He'd kill both of them. No, I need her awake and aware and undamaged in any- Ow! Way! The first speaker was obviously the Magus. The other, probably a guard or a servant, from the sound of things Akhet Ten was concentrating on taking out her anger on the Magus. The stair is too steep to risk carrying a struggling girl up it, and carry her is what I shall be forced to do. So my lord will have to permit her the freedom of her legs, and bear with the consequences unless my lord is going to insist on my carrying her and is willing to take the chance of both of us falling and breaking our respective necks. The long pause that followed this statement, and the sense that the Magus was actually considering the option, made Karun wince in spite of the fact that he wanted to pound both of them into the floor. Whoever this Magus was, he hadn't won himself any friends with that pause. No, no, of course not, said the Magus a little too late. But, ow! If my lord would at least walk a few paces ahead so that the girl cannot reach him. Now the voice sounded wary as well as impatient, and Karun wasn't at all surprised. The Magi were not known for their forbearance toward their servants, and if anything went wrong, it would be the servant who was blamed for it. He wished he could see them. What kind of a servant was this? A guard? Or someone less able to put up a fight if, when? Karun attacked. It didn't take being a guard or a soldier to talk about hitting a bound and gagged girl on the head. He'd like to think that no real soldier would think of such a thing, but he knew better. From the Tian jousters who had hauled helpless Alton peasants, including women and children, into the air and dropped them, to the Alton soldiers who had put the Temple of the Twins under siege, there was rot in both armies. And the only way to stop it was to stop the war that had made atrocity acceptable and rewarded the officers who ordered it, or looked the other way while it happened. Seft, take you! Just get her up these stairs, and I don't care how you do it! The voice snarled. He's not gaining any goodwill from the servants today, that's for sure. My lord is surely aware that even if I do not carry her, the girl could succeed in pushing me down the stairs or tripping me if her feet are left free. Is this truly what my lord wishes? The Magus paused, for too long, leaving the impression that he was considering the option of risking his servant's life and limb. You're not going higher in his estimation, you bastard. Just get that halter on her neck and get her up here! There was the sound of one set of footsteps moving a bit faster up the stairs, while the other two plodded along behind. Walk in front of her and drag her if you have to! Come on! Get her moving, you lackwit! After that, there was only the sound of footsteps. Evidently, Aket Ten wisely elected not to resist any more. Garun held his breath as they made their way up the staircase. The big question was what the nature of the man helping the Magus would be, and how big he was. Stay hidden, he warned himself. If you rush out without thinking, they can take you. If you wait until you can catch them both by surprise, you can take them. At some point fairly soon, the others will begin their attack, and it will attract a lot of attention. If you haven't found an opening before then, that will be the time. But he didn't want to wait, not at all. His stomach was in a knot, every muscle was alive with the need to fight, and he practically vibrated with tension. He wanted to get out there and hurt them the moment they appeared but he wasn't exactly trained or armed for a real fight, not the kind that was going to happen here. He didn't have a sword, because he didn't know how to use one. 
He had a club and a knife and his wits. Not so bad against a magus, but suicide against a trained soldier. From his vantage point behind the crack in the door, Karan saw the gleam of a light in the opening in the floor through which the staircase rose. Moments later, the magus himself, carrying a lantern, emerged through the opening. He wasn't one of the magi that Karan knew, but his clothing, a fine long robe of purple linen and short cloak of the same material, a belt of gold plates, and a matching collar, marked him as someone important. Otherwise, he looked perfectly ordinary, not the sort of man that Karun would look twice at if they passed each other in the street. Middle-aged, thinning hair cropped at chin level, clean-shaven, with a kind of visage that Orest called a face-shaped face, with nothing to distinguish it from a thousand like it. It struck him as he looked at the perfectly average beardless face, neither young nor old-looking, perhaps a little plumper than he should be, but nothing that could be called fat, that it was wrong that evil should look so banal. For evil this man was. He might or might not be personally responsible for the murder of dozens, the deaths of thousands, but he was involved, he knew about it, and he had willingly agreed to it and probably participated in some fashion. He had definitely participated in draining the winged ones, and their inability to see into the future as a consequence had killed and hurt people all over Alta during the earth shakes they could no longer predict. So how was it that someone who had done all of this looked like a prosperous merchant about to make a great deal? There was a smug, self-satisfied smirk on the man's face that made Karun want to punch it. But the next man rising out of the stair prevented him from doing any such thing. Definitely a professional soldier, or at least a professional bodyguard. The man was big, well-muscled, and Karun was nowhere near a match for him. But he was also angry. Karun read that in his posture and his lack of expression. He might feign a servile nature, but he hated this magus. And given half a chance and the certain knowledge that he could not be blamed for what followed, he would desert his lord in a heartbeat. Trailing behind him with a kind of collar and leash around her neck, gagged, with her hands tied in front of her, was Akhet Ten. Once again, he had to restrain himself to keep from rushing out. If the bodyguard was angry, she was furious. Her eyes above the gag flashed with rage. Her posture was rigid, her whole manner proclaiming that, the moment she got a chance, she was going to do something to the man that he would regret for the rest of his days. And that if she had anything to say about it, those days would be very short indeed. That made him weak-kneed with relief. If she had been cowed, intimidated, beaten down, he would not have been able to keep himself from running in to rescue her immediately. And if she had been sunk deep in depression and mourning for Riethka, it would be a lot harder to get her motivated to get her out. She was ready to fight for her life and her freedom, and that meant she was an ally and a potential accomplice, not a potential burden. Tie her over there, the Magus said, pointing to a spot Karun couldn't see. Look there! See the ring in the wall? Get her wrists tied up to that, then go. Get out of here. I won't need your so-called services any more. If my lord is quite certain, said the man. Yes, I am quite certain, the Magus snapped. I do not need your half-hearted and incompetent help, and what is more, you'll only be a hindrance once I begin working magic. Very well, my lord, the man said hiding both anger and satisfaction under a bland facade. It will be as you wish. He took Akat Ten to the other side of the eye, where Karun couldn't see them. When he moved back into Karun's narrow field of vision, he was alone. Go on! Get out of here! The Mega snarled, and he moved around to the same side of the device and out of sight. Go! I don't need you anymore! Very well, my lord. The guard bowed just enough to keep from being reprimanded, then followed his orders to the letter, leaving by the stair so quickly that if the Magus had been paying attention, he would have been more than just reprimanded. But the Magus was busy with the device. Karun knew that it was the device he was meddling with, and not Akhet Ten, because the huge crystal began moving very slowly rotating, and the Magus was muttering something, too low for Karun to hear what it was. The entire atmosphere of the room changed. 
Karun felt his hair starting to stand on end, and not just metaphorically, but physically, the way it did sometimes during midnight Kami scenes, or when he was flying in the dangerous tempests of this season of rains, when lightning played in the storm. There was a low hum coming from the eye, like the droning of bees about to swarm. The magus moved into his field of vision again, sketching signs in the air with his hands, still muttering under his breath. The eye rotated a little faster. It wasn't going at any great speed. A desert tortoise was a hundred times faster than it, but the fact that it was moving without anyone touching it was disturbing. Akaten made a noise around her gag. If it had been a scream or anything that sounded like a cry for help, Karan would have been out of there in an instant. It wasn't. It sounded like an insult. The Magus ignored it and Akat Ten. Whatever he wanted her for, she wasn't a priority right now. The room began to brighten. At first, for a confused moment, Karan thought it was because the light was coming from the eye. Then he realized that the light was coming from the wrong direction, not from the eye, but from the east. He's cleared the sky above the tower. Now he has light to work with. The eye rotated a little faster, the hum deepened and strengthened, and now Karun felt not only his hair standing on end, but a gut-deep reaction that made his knees feel weak. This was... wrong. Wrong in a way he couldn't put a name to, but could only feel. No, it was more than that, worse than that. This was something that had once been right and good, and had been twisted out of all recognition. Something deep inside him recognized that evil for what it was, and wanted only to run. Never in all his life had he felt this deep, soul-shaking fear. Kefti the Fat had only threatened his body. The Tian soldiers had only taken his father. The Tian jousters would only have taken his heart had they taken Avatra. This thing, this thing would eat everything that he was, ever had been, or ever would be, and leave behind an empty shell that might live, speak, talk, but would be less than a shabti figure of flesh instead of clay. And worst of all, the most horrible of all, he would know what had happened, know what he had lost, and know he would never get it back. All pleasure, all joy, all creativity would be sucked out of him, leaving nothing but an interminable, gray and unvarying existence. No wonder those former winged ones had done so little to save themselves. Death was preferable to that death in life of emptiness. Akaten screamed, her shriek muffled by her gag, but giving voice to exactly the same terror that he was feeling. He clutched the frame of the cupboard to keep himself upright and concentrated all his will on not giving in to the terror. And then the eye began to move faster. The pitch of that steady hum rose a little, and the terrible fear faded. It didn't disappear, but it faded enough so that it was bearable. What was that? He shook his head a little to clear it. His stomach was still churning, and he was so drenched with sweat he was surprised the magus couldn't smell him. What had caused that overwhelming fear? Why hadn't the magus been affected? Now he could hear Akka Ten choking on the gag, weeping hysterically and moaning. The magus came into his field of vision, tilting his head to the side and wearing an expression of pleased avidity. So sorry to upset you, girl, he said, sounding gleeful rather than sorry. But I needed to test you. The more power you have the more strongly you react to the eye as it spins up to full speed. By your reaction, I would say that you have quite a lot of power. Far more than we suspected. Karun took a very slow, deep breath as anger chased out the last remnants of terror. And in the brief moment when terror was gone, but anger had not yet flooded him with unreason, he knew he would have to keep that rage under complete control and he also knew that he could. A slave, a serf, lives with endurance and patience. He learns it because he has no other choice. He must learn to be patient or die. Orist would have attacked the Magus the moment he appeared with Akhet Ten in tow. Any of the others would have burst out of hiding in rage or terror by now. Even Ari probably would not have managed to control himself. So maybe he was the right person to be here. Keep gloating, you bastard.
he thought, behind the white-hot rage invoked by the sound of Akhet Ten weeping. Keep right on, when the feather of truth is weighed against your heart. I would not care to be you, and I swear you are going to meet the judges a great deal sooner than you think. Now I will just bring the eye fully to life, the Magus went on blithely. Would you like to hear what your destined fate is? Akhet-Ten's sobs choked off. Karan couldn't tell if it was because her own fear had turned to anger, or if it was because she was too terrified to weep. He hoped it was from the former. He was controlling himself so tightly that every muscle felt as tight as a bowstring. The Magus laughed. Ha ha ha! Oh, do glare at me, girl. Really, you should feel flattered and honored. Your power will be going to serve Alta far more effectively than that trivial ability of yours to speak with animals ever could. Oh, well, it goes to serve the Magi, but soon enough our welfare and that of Alta will be one and the same, so it hardly matters. First, he made a few more passes in the air, and this time Curran's eyes nearly bulged out of his head as he saw the fingers leaving trails of glow in the air where they had passed, forming, for just one moment, signs and glyphs. First, I will bring the eye up to full speed. I have already used some of your power, oh, about half of it, to clear the storm out of the skies over the tower, so that the eye has some sunlight to work with. I will use the rest of your power to keep the sky over the tower clear forever, no matter what the season, by making a link between the earth and air energies, using the eye itself as the physical aspect of that link. Never again will the rains prevent us from using the eye to punish those who defy and endanger us. Just think, as long as the sun shines... The eye will always be usable by daylight after this. Then, when I am finished with you, well, by then that pesky Tian army under the command of our renegades will be at the fourth ring, and I will proceed to use the eye to remove them all from our consideration. Do you understand now what your trivial sacrifice is? The Magus stopped in mid-sentence and stared out the window somewhere behind Akhet Ten. What in the... Karan strained his ears and thought he heard faint and far-off crashes, screams. Curse them all to Seft! the Magus exclaimed angrily. Wretched dragons! I knew we should have exterminated them all while we had the chance! They've begun, Karan thought, with a lift of his heart. The others had begun the attack on the forces surrounding the Temple of All Gods, using the jars of Akkadian fire. They could not have chosen a better moment to mount their distraction. Well, we'll just have to speed this up so I can exterminate them now, the Magus muttered under his breath. Burn the vermin out of the sky. About time. Should have been done years ago. He made a few more passes, and this time the glowing lines he left in the air hung there and stayed. And then, as the eye spun faster and faster, it too began to emit light, until a glowing blur hung in its place. And now, girl, it's time for you to fulfill your destiny, the Magus said, and turned his back on Karan's hiding place. Knowing he would never get a better chance, Karan grabbed his dagger and flung open the door. It crashed into the wall as he leaped for the Magus' back. Only a last-moment dodge by his opponent saved the Magus from the fate he had meted out to others. The Magus twisted cleverly out of the way, then whirled and grappled with him, trying to seize control of the dagger he held. At that moment, he realized something else. For someone as portly and out of shape as the Magus looked, he was still heavier and stronger than Karun. Karun was angry. The Magus would not hesitate for a moment to kill. Immobilize him. The Magus wrenched free of him, leaving his cloak in Karun's hands. Karan flung it aside, and the Magus went for him again, all of his attention on the knife in Karan's hand. Behind them, the eye was glowing white-hot, too bright to look at directly, spinning so fast that the hum had become a howl. 
The Magus grabbed with both hands for his knife hand, intent on getting the weapon away from him, and suddenly Karun had a flash of inspiration. He let the Magus have the knife, just let it go as soon as the Magus got his hands on the hilt, and in the moment of confusion, while the Magus stared at the weapon he was now in control of, Karun pulled the club he was carrying out of the waistband of his kilt and cracked it down hard on the offending wrist. With a screech of pain, the Magus dropped the knife from fingers that suddenly didn't want to work anymore. On the backswing, Karun connected with his temple with a solid thunk that nearly knocked the Magus over. The Magus staggered sideways, rotated on his heel, stumbled blindly toward the eye, and... and crossed the brass circle inlaid in the floor. And that was when every plan Karun had made went right out the metaphorical window. The Magus went rigidly upright and began to scream as his body began to... Well, Karun could only think unravel, because as Karun stared in horrified disbelief, it looked as if invisible fingers were tearing him apart, bit by bit, except the bits didn't bleed. All the bits were sucked into the glowing vortex that the eye had become as they were torn off. It started at his hands and feet, and as his feet vanished, he just hung in the air, as if suspended on a hook like a discarded garment. The screaming went on and on, as the unraveling went on, and the eye glowed brighter and brighter, with every bit of the magus that it sucked into itself, and part of Karun wanted to stand and watch in stunned amazement. But the part of him that was in control scooped up the knife from the floor and ran to where Akat Ten was standing with her back against the wall, her hands over her head, tied at the wrist to a brass ring embedded in the wall. As he sawed through the leather thongs biting into her wrist, the screaming mercifully stopped, but the eye continued to spin. There was a feeling of intense pressure as he cut through the last of the thongs, and then a kind of dull woof, as if something very heavy but soft had been dropped in the middle of the room. As he untied the gag holding a ball of rags in her mouth, Akhet Ten's eyes went wider than he'd ever seen before, and when he turned to look, he understood. The eye was awake and evidently had a mind of its own about what should be done now. That beam of light, thicker than his thigh, was too bright to look at, lanced out of the window, and was burning its way across the buildings of the central island. Flames rose beneath the tower, and the sounds of screams and a terrible heat and the smell of scorched rock surrounded him. The eye had already incinerated the royal palace by the time he turned, had decimated the buildings around it, and was cutting a swath across the island toward the canal. When it reached the edge of the canal and kept going, water bubbled and exploded in steam where it passed. How do you stop this thing? He yelled at Akhet Ten over the discordant howl the thing was putting out. I don't know, she shouted back. And just as if the situation they were in wasn't bad enough, he felt the stone of the tower beneath him trembling, and his stomach lurched with that all-too-familiar sickening sensation that marked an earthshake. No time for argument. He grabbed Akhet Ten's wrist and ran for the window. Not, thank heavens, the one the eye was aiming its light weapon out of. He thrust his arm out of it and groped for the rope. It wasn't there. His stomach lurched again, this time with fear. Oh no, where's Avatra? Did she fly off? Did the eye frighten her? Great Haman, is she anywhere nearby? Panicked now, he whistled, praying she was near and could hear him because if she wasn't. And Avatra swooped down out of the sky, just as the tower shook and swayed under his feet again, and out of the window he could see the ripple of the earth shake move across the land and water, as if someone had shaken out a rug. It flung them toward the window as Akhet Ten shrieked at the top of her lungs. It tossed Akhet Ten over the sill, while he shouted for Avatra, and the dragon tried desperately to maneuver closer. Karan! Akhet Ten screamed. The rest was undecipherable. Hold on! He screamed back. He hung on with one hand to the window frame, precariously sprawled over the window sill. Akhet Ten had been pitched right out of the window, and only his grip on her wrist kept her from plummeting to her death below. A second jolt rocked the tower and broke his grip on the stone, and he felt himself rolling over the window sill and out the window, completely unable to stop himself, pulled by Akhet Ten's weight. Avatra twisted herself over sideways in some impossible maneuver his eyes refused to accept just as he began to fall, and somehow she got herself halfway under him, 
with Akatin still hanging desperately onto his left hand, and he sprawled over the saddle, holding on desperately with his right. As the beam of the eye began to go everywhere from the rocking of the tower, Avatra lurched over in the air and kitted sideways, trying to compensate for their weight, trying to get down to the ground before they fell. No! Akatin's hand slipped a little out of his grip as she continued to scream at the top of her lungs, her eyes fixed on his and full of terror. Sweat poured down his arm, making his hand and hers slippery. He tried to pull her up to where she could grab a harness strap or something, but though his arms screamed with the effort, he couldn't raise her at all. She flailed, trying to catch his hand with her free hand, but couldn't seem to get a grip. No! Her hand slipped a little more, despite the fact that they were both holding on as hard as they could. Now instead of holding on to her wrist, he only had hold of her hand, and his fingers were loosening. No! He felt it. She was still slipping, as the tower collapsed behind them in a tumble and roar of stone and dust, as the earth continued to shake, as Avatra fanned her wings and tilted over sideways, desperately trying to keep them from falling. She screamed. He screamed. And then, lumbering clumsily out of the dust cloud, canted to one side, an indigo and silver miracle. Mouth gaping open with effort, Riethka tucked herself under Aketen just as her fingers slipped out of his, and caught her, as they had all practiced with sandbags, sliding her head under the falling human and forcing the victim to slide down her neck to her shoulders. It was perfect. It was beautiful. He shouted aloud with elation. Aketen sprawled athwart her dragon's neck and shoulders, and as Riethka sank lower with every wing beat, she clung on desperately without saddle or reins to help her. There was a wound in the dragon's shoulder that had been stitched shut, and holes in the webbing of her wing. Still, she bravely fought to get her rider to the ground safely, which in her mind quite clearly meant away from the central island, across the canal. Across the canal where a line of fire divided the half-ruined temple of all gods from the armed force that had been besieging it, and which now was fleeing to a man, well, staggering away, because the earth was still convulsing, and mounting wreckage made every step hazardous. Riethka landed heavily in an open courtyard, with Avatra right behind her. Half a dozen healers came running into the center of the courtyard to take Akat Ten from Riethka's back, but she slid off by herself and flung herself into Karun's arms as he jumped down from Avatra's saddle to meet her. Ah, gods, I have you. I have you safe at last. I knew you'd come, she sobbed as she clung to him, her wet cheek pressed into his chest. I knew you'd come. I knew it. She was trembling all over, his brave Akat Ten. But so was he. As he held her, it dawned on him now just why she had been so aggressive and ready to fight, rather than sunk in mourning. She had known, of course, that Riethka was alive, something none of the rest of them had any way of knowing, and that had bolstered her courage and her spirits. She had what he did not, the bond of mind-to-mind -mind communication with her dragon, so she had known all along how hurt Riethka was, that her injuries were being tended to, which they obviously had been, and what was happening to her. Very probably it had been the healers themselves who had gone out to bring the wounded dragon into the shelter of their temple when the guards had taken Akat Ten away. And the moment that the injured dragon had sensed that Akat Ten was in deadly danger and afraid, she came, as fast as her damaged body would carry her. Given how slowly she was flying, she had probably begun looking for release from the moment that the Magus worked that magic that had so frightened them both. But now she needed human reassurance as well. For that matter, so did he. He had come close, so close to losing her. He wrapped his arms around her and held her. His heart seemed to swell until it occupied his whole chest, and all he could think was how he never wanted to let her go. I'd come for you no matter where you were, he murmured into her hair. I always will. Another earthshake rocked the courtyard, throwing them against each other. The dragons flattened out their necks and whined, looking anxiously from side to side, and as the shaking went on, something odd, some inner prompting, made him look up and across the canal to the central island. The central island. Which was sinking. Or at least the buildings were sinking. 
Even as he watched, bracing himself against the trembling of the earth, arms holding tight to Akat Ten, a great plume of mixed sand and water erupted from the place where the tower had stood, and the remains of the Temple of Haman vanished from sight. 21. When the shake stopped, Karan reached out to seize one of the healers without letting go of Akat Ten. Where are, he began. The rest of the justers have already taken some of our people to safety, the healer replied, even though she was shaking with reaction. They said they are coming back. You cannot count on them returning soon enough, nor often enough to get you all out, he interrupted her. You have to get off this ring, maybe out of altar altogether. The shocks are getting worse, and he let go of her arm and gestured at the central island at buildings half sunk or completely vanished. Look, I don't know why this is happening, but it is, and it isn't. Another shake began. He and Akaten held each other up, and the water of the canal began to heave and splash. Across the canal, a spout of sand and water erupted in a new place, and what was left of the palace began to sink. This one was definitely worse. Colonnades around the garden went over, one after another and several people were knocked off their feet, and the temple of all gods had been made to withstand shakes. This isn't right, the woman cried, when the shake was over, from where she was kneeling on the ground. They're getting stronger, and longer. We have to get you out of here, he thought, hard. On the water is safest. Have you boats? She nodded, relief suffusing her round features. Enough for everyone, I think, since so many of us have already escaped and people who know how to row them. Without waiting for direction, she got to her feet and moved purposefully in the direction of the healers clustered around Rieth Ka. One of them shortly came over to him. We can get out by water, he said soberly, but there are hundreds, thousands of people on this ring. And he looked at Karun expectantly. Karun blinked, realizing that this man, this healer, who was by no means an inexperienced man by his age, was looking to him for an answer. And one came to him. Akat Ten and I can get to where no one else can, and see what no one else can. From above. And the people of Alta know Joustus, and probably trust Joustus more than anyone else right now. Akat Ten wiped her eyes with the back of her hand and gently shoved at him to get him to loosen his arms. She stood away from him a little bit and sniffed, but raised her chin. I am Akat Ten, winged one. Daughter of Lord Yatiran, people will listen to me. We will guide folk off this ring and off the next until they are safely away from danger. But Alta is dead, and there is no saving it. The healer dropped his head, and when he raised it again, Karan saw the marks of grief on his face. You say no more than what we have thought these many moons, winged one. But it is an ill moment hearing it spoken aloud. Someone must say it, or we will all perish. The speaker was an old woman, hair entirely white, falling into the royal hairstyle of hundreds of tiny plates, each ending in a gold bead. She stood very erect, and her eyes, dark and shadowed, looked directly into Karun's. He had never seen her, but he knew who she was. The eldest, the chief healer of the Temple of All Gods. We must save what we can. We will take the boats and make for the harbor. No! That was still another healer, a rough-looking old fellow with a fair number of scars. Not so, eldest. I know the sea, and the sea does strange things in shakes. It can withdraw for leagues, then come rushing back and overwhelm all in its path. No, we must take the boats and make our way through the canals inland to one of the daughters, and thence up the Great Mother River if we must. I bow to your experience, T. Renhatam, she said after a moment. But there is one thing we must do. It is more important to heal that dragon now than anything else, no matter how much it costs our healers by touch. The man looked at her aghast. But, eldest, it is but an animal, and there are many, many injured and more to come. You healers by touch can heal a few, perhaps even a dozen, before you are exhausted, the old woman said, 
with a look that dared him to challenge her. But unless you spend that same strength to heal that dragon, she will not last past noon. And then, where will all those thousands be who need the guidance of her jousta? As the man's face fell, she softened her tone. I know it is hard hearing this, T, she said softly. But you know as well as I that healing is, and always has been, a balancing game, weighing out resources against the greatest good. In the best of times, that balancing never needs to come into play. But this is the worst of times, and we must do what must be done. The greatest good right now is to heal that poor, faithful animal, so that she can serve all of Alta that survives. He bowed. Yes, eldest, he said softly. I will get the others. As he moved off, the healer turned back to Karun and Akat Ten. And as for you, heed me, children. The same advice, nay, orders, apply to you. Save the ones you can. Save the most that you can. There will be people trapped, hurt, begging for help that you cannot aid. You must leave them, leave them behind, leave them to others, but leave them. If there is a later, you may come back, but if you linger over one, when you could have saved many in that same time, you will have done the wrong thing. He gritted his teeth. He hated hearing that, but he knew it was true, and he silenced Aket Ten's protest with a squeeze of his hand on hers. Hard truths are still truths. Eldest, thank you. I will get aloft. I know that when Riethka is fit to fly, Akaten will do likewise. And as we see the others returning, I will send them to do the same. He squeezed Akaten's hand again, just as another shake began. This time, all three of them instinctively reached for each other and braced one another through the shake. They are getting worse the eldest healer said, when the dreadful rumbling and crashing had subsided. And across the canal, yet another building, or what was left of one, had vanished. Then I must go. He bent and kissed Akat Ten. You and I must separate, to cover the widest area. If the sea does what the healer thinks it will, you must go to the harbor and warn them first, for you are the daughter of Yatiran, and you know how to command. Her head came up though her lower lip trembled a little. I will do that, she said, without hesitation. Then I shall return and work the first ring and so forth. Good. He did not say, I know you will be fine, or I am counting on you, because he did not need to say any such thing. This was wing leader to Jouster. He would treat her as she wanted to be treated, not as his beloved whom he wished to protect, nor the noble daughter but as any of the other members of his wing. She could not manage a smile, but she gave a solemn nod. He sketched a salute and sprinted for Avatra. She was only too happy to be in the air, even if the air was full of dust and thick with the smoke of many fires. He began working his way along the canal, for that was where there were likely to be boats. His appearance was marked by shouts and cries for help, some of which made him want to break down and weep with frustration, over how little he could actually do. But he hardened himself, and limited himself to sending people to where he had seen undamaged boats, despite pleas for other aid. There are only two of us jousters right now. We have to find and warn others. Make for the river, he told them over and over again. The sea is not to be trusted in a shake. Get as far away as you can, until you can no longer feel the shaking. The Magi! He was asked by virtually every party he encountered. What has happened to the Magi? They are dead, he always responded, because even if it wasn't entirely true, no Magus would be safe in these lands for generations to come. As are the great kings and queens, and most who dwelled on Central Island. The gods have deserted them, even the evil gods that they once served. Alta is dying, and there is no saving her. Ocean and marsh alike are taking her back with each new shake. It is the gods' own will, and you cannot fight the gods. Now fly, fly lest you die with her. 
and at that point, since most of them owned no more than what they stood up in or had saved from the wreckage of their homes, they did not argue with him. They picked up their belongings, aided the wounded, and made for the boats. Strangely enough, at least until he thought about it, was that no one begged him to carry them away. That was what he had most dreaded, especially if it came from someone who was injured. But they didn't. In fact, they kept a cautious distance from him when he landed. And then, after a few frantic reactions to sudden moves from Avatra, he realized that they were used not to tame dragons, but the wild-caught ones. The wild-caught ones were still dangerous to anyone not a jouster or a dragon boy. Someone visibly injured might well be considered a possible menu item, and the injured were well aware of that and made a great effort to appear perfectly fine. It might have been funny if it hadn't been so tragic. The only times when he did stop and pick someone up were when he found children wandering alone, or, more tragically, infants with dead parents. Then he stopped, caught them up, and carried them to the next group with children or infants. He never gave the impromptu guardians a chance to object either. We are all Altons, he would say bluntly. We will care for our own. Tend to this little one. No one refused. Maybe they were afraid to. In any event, when he checked back with groups with which he had left children, they were caring for the foundlings as well as their own. In a couple of cases, he found a woman in the party cradling the child possessively, and he wondered, had he united a bereft mother with a replacement for the child she had lost? Ari was the first to return. Karan spotted him coming in from the south and went to meet him. By then, Akat Ten was in the air, had presumably dealt with the people at the harbor, and was working the interior of the first ring, guiding people through the maze of broken buildings and toppled statues to the one causeway still intact, a floating footbridge made of raft sections lashed together, a replacement for a causeway that had collapsed in an earlier shake. He didn't even need to say anything. He just pointed to Riethka hovering in the middle distance, and Ari practically went limp with relief. He straightened immediately, though. We saw Riethka rise from the healer's court, he called. I thought I was having a vision at first, but Seft's own chaos was breaking loose, so we landed and each took a sick or wounded healer out. It's getting... Karan began, when another shake interrupted him. By now there wasn't much left of the central island, and with this shake, buildings were beginning to sink on first ring as well. Ari took in the damage with widened eyes. By Harman's horns! he exclaimed. What is happening here? We're evacuating the city, sending them south, getting as many into boats as we can, Karan called. The rest were finding safe paths to that causeway and guiding them from the air, and I don't know why things are sinking. Maybe it's a different sort of shake than we've ever had before. I want you to intercept the others and tell them that's what they're to do. Then you go to the others, the ones with the Tian army, Great King. The Magi here are dead or running. The Queens and most of the nobles, if they were on Central Island, are dead too. You are Great King and Commander of the Armies of Alta, which are about to close in on the Tian forces. The greater need for you is there, not here. He'd thought about that as well, in the time since he and Akaten had begun this evacuation. There was no doubt of it in his mind. Under the heading of greatest good, Ari could help to save a few thousand, of which most could save themselves so long as they knew where a clear path was, or he could take his place as the ruler of Alta and save perhaps hundreds of thousands. And Ari, being Ari and very far from stupid, saw that for himself right away. So he just saluted, with no sense of irony or mocking at all and turned Cachette's head south without another word. Asit Ra was the next back, and he took immediately to working directly across first ring from where Akhet Ten was. By the time Huras arrived, they had most of first ring cleared, or at least as much of it was going to be cleared without help to extricate people who were trapped past bare hands getting them out. Those who hadn't already gotten across the causeway at least knew where the clear path to it was. Aket Ten had gotten the brilliant notion of having the survivors splash paint or mud or use anything else that would make a mark on the way to show where the safe route was. That sped up the evacuation of those behind the first out immeasurably. 
The second ring had begun to evacuate itself, warned by the collapse of Central Island and the first ring. And by those escaping across the causeway, boats were already fleeing and people streaming across the two floating raft causeways linking the second ring to the third. And on the third ring, now there was help. The third ring was home to the army. There were fewer buildings as such, fewer places for people to get trapped in wreckage. But even more important, the soldiers of Alta were used to helping in the wake of shakes, and now they, under the direction of their officers, were organizing the evacuation as refugees poured over the causeways. It was to these officers that Karun now gave a different piece of news. The false kings are dead, he said grimly, and their foolish or deluded queens with them. But Alta has a great queen and a king, Queen Nofret Tayen, once betrothed of Toreth Aket. She was wedded by the mouth of the gods, Caleth Aket, to Aure on Anethet, rider of the dragon Cachette, he who was chosen to be great king by birth, marriage to the lady Nofret, and the will of the gods. And, he would add with a significant lift of an eyebrow, he is no friend of the Magi. Of course, this was news to them, but it was clearly welcome news. It put heart in them, gave impetus to their effort. But the one thing they asked that he couldn't answer was, How far are we to evacuate? To which he could only answer, Judge by what you would do yourself. How far would you? Because he wanted to say that the third ring was far enough, but as another shake hit, and he got up into the air, he saw that half of first ring was gone. The same sand and water geysers were spouting on second, and buildings there were sinking. The shakes are getting worse, said one grizzled captain of hundreds grimly when it was over. It's not natural. You get a big shake, then you get your smaller after shakes. You don't get shakes that are bigger with each one that hits. It's all the fault of those cursed magi. Karan nodded. By now, his half of the wing was back. Aket Ten, Karan himself, Uras, Aset Ra, and Pe Atep had divided Third Ring into quarters. Aket Ten, Uras, Aset Ra, and Pe Atep were working the sections, while Karan made contact with the officers. Some of those officers had, to his immense relief, sent rescue parties back to Second Ring to try and dig out the trapped. Though, truth be told, there were fewer of those than he would have thought. The shakes that Altons have been living with since the Magi began using the eye had knocked down most dubious structures a year or more ago, and living with so many shakes had taught most Altons how to survive them. But now that the officers and fighters had shaken off their brief paralysis of being without orders, or a leader to give those orders, it was looking as though the jousters were redundant here, which meant it was time for the wing to reunite. As the army moved its rescue and evacuation efforts to fourth ring, and the other four finished their segments of third, he rounded them up and signaled them to land. We're done, he called, and got nods of agreement from all four. Seventh ring and Ari, Uras called back, looking much more at ease than he had in, well, months. By this, Karun deduced he'd found his family intact, and they were already making their way to safer ground. Have you? he began, then hesitated. Are your families minds in a boat? Uras replied with satisfaction. What there is of my family should be across the causeway to Third Ring by now, Peyatep told him and shrugged. Our city manor is deserted, Osset Ros said, but it was shut up in an orderly fashion. I assume the family went to the estate in River Horse Gnome and the servants and slaves left behind have gotten out. Right, then Ari needs us. Time to go be the great king's wing. Time to find those so-called advisors, you mean? Aket Ten said grimly, as he signaled Avatra to take off. True enough, he thought. But what will we do with them when we find them? He did not doubt that they were with the Tian army. The Tian king would be leading his forces, and he would insist on his three closest advisors being with him. No king, whether he be Tian, Alton, or skin-wearing barbarian, left the leading of his army at such a decisive moment to his generals. Such a duty was part of being king, and unless the king was very old or sick, 
or had a co-regent to wear the war crown for him, it was expected. Where the king went, the advisors went also. We aren't that priests to defend ourselves against magic. Then, of course, there was an entirely separate issue in Ari meeting with the Tian king. The king who had personally given him the gold of honor, not once, but several times. Impossible that he would not recognize Ari. What he would do about it was anybody's guess. And then to find out, if he didn't already know, that Ari was a hitherto unacknowledged and possibly unknown nephew. But that was not Curran's problem. It was Ari's. Curran's problem was to get the rest of the wing to wherever Ari was. Then he realized that would be easier than he thought. Aket Ten! he shouted, as they moved south across the Fifth Canal, which was now dotted with boats. Ask Riathka where the others are! He suspected that the dragons would have some innate sense of where the rest of their kind might be, especially if they were nestmates, and it seemed he was right. Aket Ten pointed, and they all changed direction in accordance with her guidance, as another shake made the water of the canal slosh in its basin. So intent was he on assessing the damage to the rings below, that it wasn't until they were crossing the seventh ring, wide enough that entire farming estates were set up there, and approaching the eighth and final canal, that he realized he should have known all along where the Tian army would be, because the Tian army was just starting across the only bridge that would accommodate them all, the so-called Grand Causeway of the Eighth Canal. It was huge, wide enough for forty men to march side by side. Of course, it had to be that big after all. The Alton army had to use it to get out of Alta City. It was also the only way for a large force to cross the Eighth Canal without going hundreds of leagues north. The advisors, and Curran could see them, in three war chariots behind the king's chariot, knew that this was a potential ambush point, and they knew that the eye could reach this far. But there was no sign of the Alton army, and the advisors must be certain that on an overcast and rainy day like this one, the eye could not be used. There was no need to look for Ari, though. Planted right in the middle of the causeway, just before it connected to the land of the Seventh Ring, were Ari and Cachette. Lined up behind them, Orest and Blue Westet, Manetka and Indigo Bethlen, Gan and Green Kalef, and Kalen and Brown Say Atman. The Tians might have expected an ambush. They didn't expect this. The Tian King, mindful of the fact that the massive number of troops behind him took time to react to anything, had already slowed his chariot to a crawl as they approached Ari. Ari was wearing his blue war crown, rather than a jousting helmet, and that would keep the Tian king from recognizing him until they got very close, but it couldn't be long now. And just how did Ari intend to stop the Tian army with five jousters? This isn't what I'd have done, Karan thought, as he urged Avatra to more speed. Ari was going to need all of them to back him if they had any hope of pulling off a bluff. I'd have come in and plucked those advisors off their chariots and dropped them. Then I'd have gone into negotiation. But he wasn't the great king. Ari was. And Ari was the one making the decisions. Then some instinct, something caught out of the corner of his eye, or a distant rumble made him turn his gaze briefly back the way they had come. So he was the one who saw the thing that was going to render all of Ari's plans null the ripples in the land, like ocean waves, racing toward Eighth Canal and the causeway. He shouted in alarm and pointed back at the rushing earthquake. The others looked and stared, dumbfounded. Knowing that Ari couldn't hear him, he shouted at the jouster anyway. When that wave hit the causeway, perhaps Ari couldn't hear him, but Cachette most certainly could sense something. With a startled bark of alarm, and with no warning to his rider, Cachette launched himself into the air, followed shortly thereafter by the other four. The Tian King and his advisors had just about enough time to register that there was something else wrong when the shake wave hit where they were standing. For hundreds of years, this causeway had stood firm, proof against the worst that man or nature could throw at it. Today it meant something it could not stand firm against. As Avatra threw up her head, snorting with alarm, the causeway disintegrated in an explosion of churning water, sand spouts, flying stones and brick, 
and thrashing horses. The last few soldiers just setting foot on the causeway had enough time to fling themselves backward to save themselves. The rest were flung into the water of the Eighth Canal. Whether or not they could swim was irrelevant. Very little was going to survive being dropped into the midst of a collapsing causeway. The great Tian King and his advisors did not even have time to understand what was happening before they were gone. Epilogue Roughly half of the Tian army was left after the causeway collapsed, but most of the senior officers of the army were gone, and the rest were having no luck in convincing the common foot soldiers that the collapse had been anything other than the hand of the gods raised against the Tians. Ari was in no way discouraging this attitude. When he landed again, wearing the very Tian blue war crown and declaring his lineage, most of the army was perfectly willing to declare for him, and the rest were perfectly willing to keep their mouths shut about their opinions. Especially after the Alton army that had been lying in ambush closed in behind them. They were trapped between the canal and an overwhelming opposing force. They were leaderless and masterless, and to a man, they surrendered. With ruthless efficiency, Ari set the Tian army to creating shelters for the evacuees from the rings. That last shake was the final shake, but Karan didn't know that for two days, because he had gotten an idea, and as soon as Ari was firmly in charge, he took the entire wing back to sanctuary, but not to stay. The dragons remained only for a good long night's rest, and then came flying back, but this time carrying double burdens. Kaleth, in full priestly regalia, was up behind Karun. Nofret flew on her own dragon, which was just old enough and strong enough to keep up, and she was begowned in mist linen and a small fortune in ancient jewelry, wearing something enough like the iris crown of the great queens as made no difference. The rest of them carried Tian senior priests, except for Aket Ten, who had the eldest winged one. By this time it looked as if the inevitable conflict between Tians and Altans was about ready to explode. Though the presence of the eldest healer and her seniors, and several high priests from major Alton temples was mitigating things so far as the Altans were concerned. Kaleth dismounted first. The Tians probably had never seen a living mouth of the gods before, but there was no mistaking the aura that hung about him. He'd had that look from the moment that Karun had come to get him and the Tian priests, but now it was so powerful that even those who were not particularly sensitive to such things were staring at him open-mouthed. There was also no mistaking the fact that the most senior of all priests of Tia were deferring to him with profound humility. The crowd cleared a path for them as they marched, with as much grace as middle-aged men and women who have just endured a long and somewhat uncomfortable trip can muster toward Ari. Meanwhile, Nofret landed on her own, putting her dragon down right beside Cachette, but remaining in her saddle. As they reached Ari, Karun was halfway expecting some sort of portentous announcement, a hail great king of Tia and Alta sort of thing. Instead, Caleth paused for a beat or two, then with great deliberation gave Ari the bow of equals, which the others echoed, and which Ari returned. We come at your summons, great king, Caleth said simply. How may we serve you? There it was the implied blessing not only of the gods of Alta, but of Tia as well. There was a stirring throughout the ranks as word of what had happened was passed from man to man. At that point, Nofret dismounted from her dragon and joined him. He reached out to her, and the two stood side by side, a somewhat foreign sight to the Tians, but a comforting and familiar sight to the Altans. Ari's reply was equally simple. Help us build a kingdom from these two shattered lands, he told them, more than loudly enough to be heard. Then, great king, perhaps we could begin with a double crowning, said the high priest of Harras. And so, with a lack of pomp and ceremony that was somehow more impressive than all the chants and processions, all the clouds of incense and weighty speeches possible, it was done. It was at that point that Karun signaled to the rest of the wing, and with a lifted chin, suggested they take themselves elsewhere. 
Lord Kaman and Lord Yatiran would be coming in a more conventional fashion, along with whatever others of rank wished to appear, and Ari and Nofret had all the support they needed for right now. They took themselves to a sand blow from which all the water had drained, and which had absorbed sunlight and was now satisfactorily, by draconic standards, hot. The dragons promptly made themselves wallows, and Karun looked with longing at a patch of lush grass shaded by date palms nearby. Gan yawned. I could sleep for a week, he exclaimed. Me, too, Orist agreed, as Akka Ten and Karun exchanged a glance and hastily looked away. But Orist, observant for once, caught it. Oh, here, he said gruffly giving his sister a shove so that she stumbled and ended up in Curran's arms. Stop mooning at each other! You thought you'd never see each other again, and now everything has turned out fine! Oh, well, fine for us. Act like flesh-and-blood people for a change and do something about it! Curran felt himself flushing and grinning at the same time. I don't know, he said to Akat Ten. Should we really give him the satisfaction of following his advice? Yes, she said decisively. It's the first time he's ever given good advice on anything. We'd better take advantage of it while it lasts. She put her arms around him, and he held her while the others sauntered pointedly away. This was not going to be easy. In fact, they were going to have a long, hard slog to get to that attractive future Caliph had promised. Two enemies were being united into a single people, and that alone was going to make for a thousand problems. But for now, there was a little peace, and someone to savor it with. You're right, he said to the pair of merry brown eyes turned up to look into his. We should. Good advice from your brother is too rare to squander. Hmm, she replied, and raised one eyebrow. Shall we let this lot of sluggards loll about while we go take a flight? A flight. A flight where they were not hunting, not scouting, not doing anything but fly together. As if responding to their very thoughts, Avatra and Riethka heaved up out of the sand wallow and came trotting over to them, making eager little noises. I think, he replied with his heart already soaring into that free blue sky as he looked down into those eyes. That would be perfect. This concludes Sanctuary by Mercedes Lackey. Narrated by Ryan Burke. Copyright 2005 by Mercedes R. Lackey. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Mercedes Lackey care of Scoville Galen Gauche Literary Agency, Incorporated, and was produced in the year 2019 by Tantor Media, Incorporated, a division of recorded books, which holds the copyright there, too. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks.